All right. Well, we've waited a long time and uh, thank you so much for your waiting. This is the new U.S. application explained. And my name is Dr. Mizani and I'm, uh, I'm a family physician. And, and the reason why I'm here is because I've sat on two residency selection committees and, and before that, just, you know, pretty uh, tumultuous and, and, and rocky road to, to get to medical school, to, to graduate, to get into residency, to survive residency. Watch some of my residents did not survive it and, and they got kicked out. And, you know, so anyways, long story short, you know, I'm here because I want to share my experiences and, I, and a lot of the, the, the advice that we give you is, is uh, based on the historical changes that have happened. And we use all of that historical data and, and experiences to make your application better and make you more competitive. And that's what this is all about. It's about making sure that you understand what competition means in this uh, professional setting. How can you use all of the skills that you have? How do you better utilize them to, to, to be able to compete? Uh, this is webinar number nine of 25. Take a look at these topics that we're going to be covering, the ones that we've already covered, number one through eight. You can find all of these on our YouTube channel, uh, on the playlist. And number nine today, ERAS application explained, uh, new for the 2024, and we're going to go as step by step. So some of the uh, platform changes, so we're going to start with the platform. So electronic resident, uh, residency application service is, uh, uh, is, is owned by the Association of American Medical Colleges. And that's where you go to apply to programs. And, uh, and it's called My ERAS. That's the application. And so you, once you get a token from uh, either your, uh, if you're a U.S. medical student, you have to get it directly from ERAS. And, uh, and your dean supports you and, and, and sponsors you. If you're an international medical graduate, you get your residency, uh, your ERAS token, you get it directly from Education uh, Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. And that token is going to be available towards the later part of June uh, of, of each year. So once you get that, you get into my ERAS app application and, and the platform. And these are the changes that we see uh, here. These changes have been long overdue. I mean, literally I've been waiting for 20 years to see these things happen. And did not happen. It, didn't really start to take shape until the pandemic happened. And then within the pandemic, just some incredible stressors on the system. Some some medical students, uh, uh, well, a lot of them, uh, they, they voiced their opinions over the years. And, and thankfully, the Coalition for Physician Accountability put their foot down and, and uh, we're now seeing the, the, all of those changes. I never thought we would get to this day. I honestly didn't. It's, it's really a happy day for me. Uh, to be able to have this webinar and presentation and one of the reasons why we've put these you know 25 topics together for you is because we're just so excited to see these changes because it makes it, it's going to make your residency candidacy better it makes things so much clearer and uh, and and you're going to ultimately if we if you play this your cards right and you know how to put this application together not only will you end up in places that in residency programs that uh, that you're going to enjoy, but the programs are going to enjoy having you. Uh, and and uh, the the mismatch between residents and and programs is a major problem here in the United States because every year about you know two thousand residents get dismissed or they get forced to resign. And so the whole idea is holistic review. We've been talking about holistic review for uh, you know for for over a year now. We've been showing you webinars on how holistic review is becoming the thing. And what holistic review is supposed to do, it's supposed to replace uh, standardized screening. For example, USMLE scores, years of graduation, they're, 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 they're not favored anymore. And so there's still some program directors and, and individuals that will tell you to go in and, you know, and take step three or do research or USMLE scores matters. But, you know, that's okay. They'll, they'll kind of work themselves out of the system and they'll, uh, they'll eventually uh, catch up with what's happening. But thankfully this is not just me saying it just a few program directors saying it this is coming you know from the top down from bottom up everywhere from all angles this is happening so holistic review of your application is a good thing it's a good thing for those of us that uh, have a tough time writing uh english have a tough time expressing ourselves and uh, and and some were just really great test takers or they spent five six years taking the us assemblies and the scores were very high but then when we see them in person it was just we couldn't communicate with them those individuals are going to have a little bit of a tougher time but that's okay that's okay if this is you if if english is not you know communication uh public speaking uh interviews if those things make you nervous you're not alone uh, we've all been there this is a good time to start practicing and and the reason why it's so important that these changes you you accept them and you you understand what they're for is because once you get into residency you're going to be put in very tough positions where you're going to have to make some leadership decisions and people are going to be looking at you they're going to all eyes are going to be on you and and so might as well start right now know what you're you're applying for it's very different uh, than, than anywhere else in the world 
And so these changes are very welcome. So now that I've said that, I've been meaning to say that for, for 20 years. And so I'm really happy to do this because our entire organization, AC Medical, has been built on all of these changes that we, we now see uh, in, in action. And so this really blends in really well with, with our mission and goals. So with no further ado, residency applicants and fellowship applicants, you both uh, can use the ERAS uh, platform. Residency applicants, you'll be able to signal uh, residency programs. Now, the residency programs have to, you know, they have to participate. Specialties have to participate. We're going to have more on signaling. Uh, Platform-wise, the application now has uh, meaningful experiences and geographical preferences. Again, we're going to cover uh, these in, in much more detail. And residency programs, again, look at that, holistic review. This is all over uh, AAMC's website. Everybody's talking about it. They're, they're encouraging these programs to not just have one person look at a thousand applications, but but really they're giving these programs the tools that are coming from you so that they can match these your your characteristics, what you bring to the program with what the program needs and wants and wants to accomplish. I'm gonna I'm gonna show all of this to you in just a moment. It's supposed to improve this screening process. The screening process was just you know blatantly put, it was horrible. Uh and and so you know you had you know, a lot of programs looked at a score and and you know we would spend our entire life trying to get high USMLE scores and and that was not the way to screen uh, candidates USMLEs were never meant to do that so this is supposed to improve screening process and uh, and there there all of these changes is to to help programs find applicants who are genuinely interested in that program and and there the the application the changes is supposed to extract your interests and it's supposed to extract your experiences and programs are going to take these two and all the detailed questions that you're supposed to be answering they're going to take these and they're going to match it up to their setting they're going to match it up to their mission and they're going to match it up to their goals now let's talk about setting program setting what do, you, what do we mean by this this is whether the program is rural whether it's urban suburban whether it's in an academic environment whether it's in a community environment is it serving a niche uh, community? Uh, what kind of socioeconomic status uh, the majority of the patients have? What is the ACGME status of this program? So, you know, program setting is important. So if there is a mismatch, let's say that nobody, somebody that's just come to the United States and, and they've never been in, in rural America, um, you know, and, and maybe they get homesick. Uh, a lot of people do get homesick. And so the individual may think that, well, they can just get up and go and, and or, or get on a leave of absence. And um, it, this happens a lot abroad, but but it, it can't happen here in the United States because they this there's a commitment, and and so they want to make sure that that individual is going to stay. So this is a, a little bit about setting. Now, mission. I found this online, um, University of Mississippi Medical Center, that has done a really fantastic job in taking the Coalition for Physician Accountability's uh, recommendations and in, in in clearly outlining what their mission, what their vision, what their goals, and how they plan to get there, and what are they looking for. Now, let's take a look at their mission. Our mission is to equip physicians with the necessary knowledge and skills for improving the health of the individual and population by identifying health needs, designing, implementing, and evaluating health services, and managing the health of individuals, communities, and define populations with a focus on reducing health disparities decreasing disease burden and improving health outcomes and who will successfully attain board certification in the field of public health and general preventive medicine and completion uh, after completion of training. Now, for those of you that are concerned that, you know, if I was in, in your shoes, for those of you that are concerned and you're thinking, well, how am I going to do this and, and align my mission with let's say 150, 200 programs that I plan to apply to, isn't it just because, you know, they're a family medicine program and I'm interested in family medicine and isn't that enough? Well, it, it, we thought that it was. And then, and then, you know, when we went into the, the residency program and went into that setting, a lot of people just didn't match. And so don't let this scare you. You don't have to go through every single program and, and try to, you know, create individual personal statements to appeal to every one of them. You'll notice as you as you go through every program's website that you receive an interview from. You'll notice that the majority of the missions are almost identical, and which is a good thing, right? So, for example, in this mission statement, everything that they've said all the way up to 
uh, everything that they said all the way up to the board certification, even the board certification, almost every residency program is going to uh, is going to push for that. They want to see a 100% board passing rate. Not all of them have it, but they all want to make sure that their residents pass the boards. And uh, in the, the this is the only difference with, between this program and the others, because this is the preventive medicine and you could put two and two together. They want to make sure that you become board certified in the field of public health and general preventive medicine after completion of program. If you just take that part out, almost every other program is going to have the same goal. So as you're putting your application together, that's what you should focus on is take a look at the mission statement of about 10, 15 programs in the specialty that you're looking for. Once you feel comfortable that, yeah, they're all saying about the same thing, then you can kind of relax and you'll be good with this new aspect of, of how programs are supposed to find what they're looking for. Now, how do you implement this in your application? Not only are you going to have to, we're going to do it through the application, the, the new changes and the experiences section, but in your personal statement, where you do your clinical experiences in the U.S., you can talk about the setting that those uh, programs were in. Maybe you don't want to just commit to one setting, uh, then maybe you want to do your clinical experiences in three, four different environments, maybe uh, an academic, maybe a, a community, maybe in an urban and a and a rural when you've got all four of them and make sure that the letter writers kind of talk about that and you talk about it in your personal statement and then we talk about it in the experiences section and it all works out really well now we're going to go to the next section the next session here was you know how are you going to accomplish this mission and what does it have to do with us let's say as, as candidates well the reason why this is important is because they're saying look residents we want to make sure that you're 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 on, on, on the same page as us when you come here this is not just going to be classroom. We need your help to help us get there. We have goals, which is going to be the next slide that we're going to talk about. We have goals that we have to meet. We are a business. You are an employee. We are your supervisors. This is not just about you coming in and learning uh, like you did back in med school. This is work. And we want to make sure that you understand what it is that as a team of colleagues, we're trying to accomplish. And we read the mission statement. What they're trying to, uh, they're going to accomplish this by giving the residents a range of academic, clinical, and population-based experiences to develop their knowledge and skills needed to become preventive medicine physicians. And these experiences are designed to teach the ACGME 6, uh, ACGME core competencies. Again, trigger word. We've been talking about ACGME core competencies for years, a lot more in the past six months. And so it behooves you that when you have your letter writer agreeing to uh, recommend you to programs, generic letters don't work anymore. I, I I hear all the time that a physician will give you four or five examples or templates and say, choose one and and you go ahead and choose one. And, and that's, you know, that's always it's going to backfire moving forward from this point forward. They have to be specific. They got to talk about ACGM core competencies because these programs are going to be looking for those characteristics, for those skills in your application, in your letters of recommendation and in your personal statement. And then on top of all that, you got to be able to sound the same way as you presented yourself in your ERAS during the interviews. So they're also going to accomplish this by having a uh, environment that emphasizes excellence in research and patient and population care, quality improvement, patient safety, professionalism, commitment to well-being, et cetera, and then modeling and, and mentoring by faculty, the value of importance of healthcare teams, scientific curiosity, problem solving skills, integral intellectual rigor. All of these are almost identical with every single program. So again, Feel comfortable knowing that, you know, for the most part, most of the programs are going to accomplish the uh, these goals the same. So now that we know the mission, we know how they want to accomplish it. We have to think about how am I going to help them get there? That's the biggest change for those of you that participated in the match in 23, 22, 20, anytime before this year and how the your approach is going to have to change moving forward. Now you have to think about the program you're applying to, how you're going to make them better. It's not so much that you're looking for a program that's going to make you strong. You actually have to think about how am I going to make the program strong. Specific goals of the training program. Again, I want to just, you know, I want to just make sure that I point out that this is for preventive medicine and preventive medicine is um, is is not a, a PGY-1 uh, specialty. So they are going to be more research based and they are going to be more uh, a little bit more advanced, but you know, you can, but even at that level, the ideas are the same. You need to know what the goals of the programs are. And again, when you research 15, 20 programs and you see that almost all of them are about the same, you can feel comfortable. Now you can focus on your own strengths, how to meet these goals. Take a look at these. Educating the principles and practices of public health. Take that out, put internal medicine. Take that out, put general surgery uh, and population medicine. Great. 
educating on underlining determinants of health causes of, of health disparities and approaches to reducing disparities. This is the same for any primary care specialty. Developing the skills in the core function of public health and health system changes, quality improvement and patient safety. This is systems-based practice in ACGM core competencies. This is something that you, uh, you all need to be familiar with and including that in your application. Developing skills in clinical care and clinical prevention. Great, we, we do that in all the specialties. Developing skills in working collaboratively with a range of stakeholders applies to every specialty. Developing skills in the conduct of research. You know, preventive medicine is more research-based. Family medicine, much less research-based as far as their initial demand of you when you apply to them. Promoting scholarship, leadership, and public health. Again, take that out put the word of the specialty you're applying to and promoting lifelong learning. So you have to think about what in my experiences am I going to talk about in my ERAS application? So if a program like this or an internal medicine program, just put whatever specialty you want in there, that when they look at my application, everything is going to line up. Okay. So here are the specific changes within the my ERAS application system. So in the past, before this year, there was an unlimited number of experiences that you could create. And over the years, we've always asked our, our members to limit the total entries to 15 maximum, because it takes a long time to read these. And if you put a 25 page ERAS application in front of me, I'm probably not gonna wanna read it. I'm probably just gonna get, you know, I just don't have the time to do that. And if you put something that complex in front of me, that probably tells me that, uh, I don't know. It's just maybe there's just too much that's happened here. So you got to simplify it. You got to cut it down. And so we've been doing that for years. And ERAS just said, look, you know, we're going to go ahead and limit it to 10 anyways. So 10 entries and you can take three up to 10. You could have one up to 10. So you can mark three of them as the most meaningful to you. And there is now a type section. So before it was just volunteer work and research and you have a lot more options now. So up to 10 entries, you can mark up to three of them as the most meaningful to you. What this is supposed to do is as a selection committee member, when I get your application, I'm going to be able to, okay, so what are the three most meaningful? So I'm just going to read those first. If I like those, then maybe I'll read the rest. Maybe I'm looking for somebody with a type of experience in, uh, you know, in, in, in urban, because this is where we are. Maybe I'm a, I'm a rural program and I'm only looking for people with rural and I'm going to look for those type of experiences. This is how holistic application is supposed to work. Theoretically, it makes a lot of sense. Practically, if, if implemented, it's going to work, you know, because what you've said in your application, you're going to get interviews from programs that, that are looking for the characteristics you have. So again, theoretically, it's going to work. It should work. This is the first year they're doing it. All of these, by the way, came from the supplemental ERAS application. Supplemental ERAS is, you know, physically gone, but these are components of supplemental ERAS that, that we, they found to be uh, very effective and and so they're implementing it now under one system. It's a lot better this way, a lot more streamlined. Mission-focused characteristics. Again, everything you write in your ERAS application, in personal statement, you've got to think about the mission statement of the program, mission state of, of the program. So how do you take that and look at yourself, self-reflect and say, okay, you know what? I can match. And this is a really good exercise because um, this helps you in your development of the leadership skills that you need to have. And it also helps you with your public speaking. One of the biggest problems with public speaking is, you know, you may not want to be, you don't want to be embarrassed and you may, you may feel like you're just not connecting with individuals. And, but if you can connect this way, if you already done a lot of self evaluation and, and, and so you're going to have a, a fun time going through this process because you're developing a quality that, that is very important in, in, in residency. And that's what they're looking for because they want to make sure that these experiences are going to support the programs so that the programs can just go to what they're looking for and be able to support their own holistic uh, review of your application. So they're going to look for what settings you were in. They want to know what focus areas that you're interested in, what key characteristics of yours matches what they're looking for. Remember this part from a few slides ago, residency programs are going to have a better and easier. Well, I'm not sure if it's going to be easier, but they're going to have the tools they need to not have to rely on uh, USMLE scores and year of graduation, but, but to be able to look at everything that you did that you want to present, that you mark as most important, and to be able to match your, match your interests and uh, experiences to their settings, missions, and goals. See how this whole thing is kind of matching up? 
Uh, and that's why I'm so excited is because uh, this type of consistency is, is great in an application. I, I, the, the end product is going to be great. Next, there's going to be an impactful experiences section uh, under, under experiences. And this part you have to be very careful with because from our experience with supplemental ERAS, you don't want to make this a sad entry, but it should be about how you overcame uh, some major challenges and, and, and some hardships. You can talk about family issues. You can talk about background, some financial hardships. You know, uh, did you have any difficulties in the communities that you were raised in? Um, how about your education? Just general life matters that you've overcome. But again, you want to be very careful with this because you don't want to make them feel sad for you and 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 have pity. And, and then that's why you think that you're going to get an interview. That's not what this is about. You really have to look at the end goal. So as you're writing this, I want you to think about the positive aspects of where you are right now. Come up with your strengths back into those strengths and then see how you got to those strengths, right? How you got to those strengths and focus on that. Start with the strengths. Then you want to go in and talk about the life challenges. Make sure that they feel good about the person that they're considering uh, to interview. So this, you have to put a lot of thought into this. This is like a mini personal statement that you have to write about. But this whole experiences section is like, a, like, a, like up to 10 personal statements. So you have to put a lot of thought into this. And what's interesting is that ever since the 2021 program director survey, and this is uh, courtesy of NRMP and it's available to everybody online. And, you know, we've been talking about overcoming significant obstacles, which is what it was called, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when, when the survey came out to program directors. And even back then, uh, all specialties program directors, 75.5% of them said that they will look for if a candidate has overcome significant challenges, 75, 20, 25% probably just didn't have time or know how to even do this in an application because they're just so busy and so much to look at. And they gave it an importance of 4.1 out of five. And, you know, just for comparison, USMLE scores, even back in 2021, the importance of that was somewhere between a 3.4 and a 3.8, depending on the specialty. So these personal characteristics, even back then, two, three years ago, were starting to take shape. These were starting to become a lot more popular and important. And, uh, and now it's being supported with, with the changes in, in my years. So I just wanted to kind of share this with you so that you can, and you can connect the dots and see how these are all connected with each other. Well, one thing I want to share with you here while we are here. Oh, that, that factor right above this, you see this right here, perceived commitment to specialty, and it's got a 79.5% uh, popularity rating. That's not the importance of it. The importance of it is right here, perceived commitment to specialty, and it got a 4.3. That's another way that you can score a lot of points in your application. So as you're thinking about your background and hardships and challenges that you've overcome, and you're trying to you know put a positive spin to it, um, think about how you're also going to not ignore all these other factors that these programs are going to be looking at. And so commitment to specialty is something that you should consider in your overall application. And, 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 and that's, again, it's really good in aligning your interests with the programs, because if you start to think about perceived commitment to specialty, you're not going to think about applying to three, four specialties anymore, right? How many people do you know that they've applied to pediatric, psychiatry, family, and internal medicine, right? Both US and international medical graduates and students. And, and med school advisors support all of that. Apply to a specialty and a backup specialty. There is no such a thing. There's not a backup specialty. You find the specialty that you're going to commit to, commit to it, build your professional career around it, and go for it. Now, be wise with that specialty, uh, but we're looking for that. And so make sure that you do the same. And the holistic approach to application review supports all of this, right? So, which again, is good for you, good for the program, less dismissal, less um, termination, less forced resignation i'm just over the moon with with what the potential of, of uh, all these changes are so take some time go ahead and take a look at the 2021 program director survey and um, it's quite enlightening there's some changes on the uh, this is new uh, geographical information uh it, it they started off again i don't know if you remember remember that hometown uh which we are like hometown okay uh it's kind of weird uh and you could type wherever you want and and we had people putting like five cities in there or you know, just country and it was just all over the place. And so now, you know, there's a, there's an expanded geographical information that they'll collect on you. Not only will they collect it on you, but they'll also collect it on the experiences that you've had. Uh, they put a lot of thought into this and you can also share with the programs of what your preferences are. 
And the biggest thing, the biggest thing with regards to geographical is, um, you know, whether you want to be in that area, at least, I mean, it's down to states or a few states, regions of the United States, uh, whether you want to share that with the programs, whether you've had experience in the setting that the program is in, uh, the population that is serving, and whether you're willing to uh, to use some of your signals to, um, to, to let the programs know. Now, program signals, what is that? It's, you know, the idea is simple. You like a program, you'll get a set number of signals. It varies by specialty and you use them. And it's kind of like, reminds me of, uh, of the 45 programs you can apply to during SOAP. Really makes you think about how you're going to use this new resource of yours, which this resource is program signal. So the idea is I'm going to signal the program and the program is going to know, well, you know, this person is, is signaling me because, you know, they must really be interested in me because they're only going to get a limited number of signals to send uh, to programs. So this is a list. Again, this is from AAMC. Uh, you can you can uh, take a look at these yourself too. But anesthesiology, uh, they have different types of signals, like you really, really like them and then you kind of like them. So you have gold and you have silver. Then uh, dermatology, 3 and 25, right? Child neurology, 3. Uh, let's see, family medicine. They participated in, in signaling. They did not participate in supplemental ERAS, but now they are participating in, in signaling. So that's interesting. Five of them, internal medicine, seven. Uh, so out of you know 200, 300 programs you apply to, you can pick seven to apply to. 25 for neurosurgery, uh, OBGYN, three and fifteen. I mean, you can you can read these numbers yourself. So let's say that you know you want to you want to end up at a at a really big name uh, facility. You can signal them. Right. But just know that, uh, you know, you're you're using that signal at a place that may be super competitive and but you never know. Right. You never know. Uh, but it's anyway, it's going to make you really think about uh, where you want to end up. And and I think that in the long run, this is probably going to make a, a pretty big difference, because if you may, you may prefer that program and the program has to prefer you, too. And so if you signal them and they interview you and they like you, then then, you know, that that should resolve a lot of the issues. And you really, this means that you have to, you have to research the program and, and see what it, why is it that you're signaling them, right? So summary of the changes. Um, there are, now you can have up to 10 experiences before it was unlimited. Uh, so the, the, by the way, plus is an, uh, another pro of this. For those of you that have had a big gap since medical school graduation is, which I'm not sure if, if well, I guess it's, I guess, I guess overall it's, it's probably better because, you know, it was a pretty big point of bias by programs if somebody had like a 20 year gap if they if we didn't see that gap be explained back to back to back in your ERAS application maybe you would think that hey that we're withholding something from us or but now since you're limited to 10 you're not really looking at chronological description of what you did since graduating from medical school it's much more about just things that mattered in your life so the reason why I feel good about this is because you know it just you know it just sucks to 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 uh, you know judge somebody because they've had to take care of you know their families and and make money and 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 survive and and because of that you know if they missed out on four or five years of of, of residency not applying to residency now they've gotten themselves in, in a position where they can focus on themselves to judge them based on that that's that's unfair uh so i, I like that 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 this hopefully will remove that um, what we used to use is to just go directly and just look at the chronological order of events. And so it should make things a, a, a little bit more pleasant as you as you put this application together and less less stressful. Uh, you can self-select three of 10, up to 10 experiences that you that you enter as as most meaningful to you. Uh, the description is now expanded. You have to explain a lot more and, and better categorize them. Uh, what was your position? What was the organization? What was the time frame? What was the location? How many times did you go? Uh, do you remember when we we filled that ERS application? Was just say how many hours a week? And uh, you know we would say maybe let's say one hour to five hours a week. Somebody would put five, and they it was like a volunteer position. They would just go there once a year or maybe once a month, but it would cover. They've been doing it for ten years, so you would have the start date and end date at two hours uh, a week. And, and it was in a whole different country. And that just never made sense to us. And it was such a thorn on our side. And we all knew that this was problematic, but it was just not being, you know, it wasn't changing. But thankfully that has not changed. So now you can better um, characterize what uh, this, uh, you know, what this experience, how much time did you commit to? So it doesn't make you look like a liar, 
right? Because one of the questions, well, how could you be in, in India while you're telling me that you were here in the United States? Well, you must not be telling the truth. No, it's a problem with how ERAS was designed and it was just old. It was a dinosaur and it needed to change. And so again, that's why we're so excited because it's, it allows all, you know, it gives you so much more breathing room so that you, you don't get, get hurt um, at, at the end. Experience type, whether it was a hobby, whether it was a part of a professional organization, and uh, this is very explicitly mentioned, programs are gonna use that for their holistic review. So you better pay attention to this. Uh, and um, you know, maybe a program is, is concerned about how you manage your stress. So maybe they wanna know about your hobbies, but I think having a nice balance between all of this is gonna be pretty important. Uh, and um, you know, there's gonna be not just one experience that you're gonna have, not just, you know, uh, two or three fields that you have to fill out. There is just a lot of questions per experience. And then we got a worksheet that we're gonna go over and just show you. And so it's just, there's a, there's a they're looking at it in, in multi dimensions, which is how life is. And so hopefully they're gonna better select people that they're inviting for interviews so that the interview experience is gonna be good. This is, it's so important that your experience throughout this whole process is good, that you're not begging anybody to give you an interview, that you're not, when you get that interview, it's like, okay, they, they've really gone through my application, hopefully. Uh, and, and programs are just gonna get better and better as the years come. Uh, and, um, you know, there's gonna be much more critical information that you have to go out and disclose. But on the flip side, let's say that, um, you know, the role that you had is questionable. If, if you did something, let's say you did some clinical experiences that were not insured, right? And so this is gonna ask a lot of those questions, uh, tough questions to try to, figure out whether whatever experience you had is, is something that the program wants to endure. And so that's why you gotta be very careful. There's a lot of questions. It's got a lot of angles per experience, but that also means that the more of this that you fill out, the more your it's easier for the programs to, to see, right? So now you really have to think about, okay, what, what did I do? Was that wrong? And, and for those of you that are thinking, let's say that you got a, I don't know, you got a, you got a six month offer from a, from a physician, down the street that says, look, come over and, and come over here. I'll let you, you know, do histories and, and see patients and I'll give you a letter of recommendation. I may even call the program down the street and, and recommend you myself. And, and you may be considering that, and, but it's uninsured, not getting paid, don't have a physician there. And a lot of times these physicians just get up and leave the clinic. And, and what are you gonna do? Just get stuck with, you know, 30 patients that are coming in. How dangerous is that? That's a that's the unlicensed practice of medicine. And so really think about the things that you've done or the op opportunities um, that are being presented to you. And look, it's coming to light. This is this is it. And so, um, yeah, again, we're excited about this because rather than you having to be faced with questions like that in an interview or you match it into a program, then state medical board finding out about, oh, well, this wasn't right, what you did after you match and then you lose your match. And this happens, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Why go all down, down this road after so many years of, of agony and, 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 and uh, you know, try to get yourself to this point just to see that your match is taken away. I would much rather you just not get an interview from that program that is gonna have a problem with this uh, and, and be, be done with it, right? Don't you agree? Don't you think this is a lot better? Again, I'm just really excited. The hometown is no longer just a text field. You know, you, you, there's there's like addresses, city, state, zip codes, um, uh, including with, uh, with 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 the educational section. And then you have an option to share these with the programs, and and uh, uh, and the programs can use that to see if they uh, wanna wanna invite you for an interview. All right, so this is the uh, this is the ERS application. So this worksheet again, it's available to all of you. And, uh, and you can uh, go ahead and, and, and download this. So we're, I'm just gonna go section by section. So you can take, we're, gonna, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but I'll let you know like which sections are, are, are where the changes uh, that have occurred. Let me make this a little bit larger for you. Again, this is a courtesy of Association of American Medical Colleges. This is not uh, AC Medicals. We you know we thank uh, all the work that they've, that they've done so much. I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, really happy for, for this day to, to be able to be alive and actually see this happen. I never thought it would happen. I just can't tell you. It's, two decades of putting up with that old ERAS application is just always oh, a torture. Um, so, uh, okay, so let's take a look at this. All right, so, um, yeah, so the, 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 the these first parts are, are all pretty self-explanatory. All right, so let's go over here to the work authorization section. And, uh, and you know, there is a point that, uh, that, that I wanna make sure that, that you are familiar with 
for those of you that have a work authorization number in the United States, or you already have a, uh, you know, that you you already have a, uh, you're, you're, you're like on a J2, or you're on an M2, or you're an F2, that your your spouse is is the individual who uh, who had who has the visa, and then you're here because of them. Uh, and if you mark that you do not need a visa, thinking that that's going to increase the number of interviews um, that you get, maybe it will, uh, probably will, but they're going to be pretty pissed off when they find out that, oh, you said you don't need a visa because you have, you're dependent of somebody else who has a visa. And, and that's not what programs want to see at all. And you don't want to be in a situation like that. That will never work out well. So if you, uh, if you have a work authorization number, I strongly recommend that you contact DCFMG and say, look, this is what my situation is. Um, and what should I put here on the ERS application? And they'll probably tell you to say, yes, I do need a visa because you know it depends on how you got that work authorization number that could be taken away from you. And if that's taken away from you, you can't stay there in that program. And the program is then gonna have to sponsor you. They, they don't wanna deal with that at, at that point. They'll be pretty upset that, that you put them in a situation like that. So, uh, and that could be basis for dismissal, by the way. Um, there is one of the biggest basis for dismissal and one of the biggest basis for residents uh, for uh, licensure applications not being approved is misrepresentation of facts on your application right uh and and it could be unintentional it could be intentional it could be for you know self-serving reasons like well, i'm going to increase my number of interviews let me just say i don't need a visa because i got a work authorization or i have an f2 or whatever the case may be if they find out they can dismiss you from programs and 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 i speak with program directors all the time the person i was speaking with right now was exactly a situation uh, about this this program director was so upset that um, a candidate had said uh, that with regards to the previous residency, they were in a residency, they didn't mention it in their application. They didn't mention it because they thought that, uh, you know, the letters of recommendation they're submitting is enough and the program dismissed them because they didn't mention that part of their uh, their life. Now, it's a pretty big thing to mention, uh, but visa is certainly the same thing. So that's, that's the comment I have about work authorization. Uh, if you are in the match with somebody else, let's make this a little bit bigger for you. So if you're in the match with somebody else, you want to go ahead and, and say it. Uh, be careful, though, because if you put their NRMP ID number here, they're going to be able to download their application as well. And, um, you know, if that person is applying to a whole different specialty and, uh, you know, you just got to get your stories right with one another because you don't want to make things tougher for that other individual. So um, match, a uh, couple's match is a, is a whole different ballgame. And not too many people participate in it, but, uh, but if you do... Um, that's a that's a whole different topic of conversation. Uh, oh, this is a little bit too small. Here we go. All right. So uh, urology match. Uh, we won't talk about that here. Additional information. Uh, okay. Uh, ACLS, PALS, BLS. It's all the same as as the previous years. Uh, you want to make sure that those are all filled. You don't want to leave those empty, especially if you're an international medical graduate. Self identification is is the same as previous years. Uh, let's see, language uh, is the same as previous years. Uh, military information is the same, no changes. We do have a really good series of webinars on how to fill out the ERAS application. Uh, we did it for 2022 and 2023 match, and it's a, it's a part of our playlist on our YouTube channel. Please go over there to, to see how do you fill out these different sections. Uh, but uh, essentially these parts are not said. Now here's your geographic preferences. This part is, is changed. And we're going to read this, and and this is all new to to me. Um, I mean, I have a lot of experience with the supplemental years, but this is the first year that they're uh, putting it out here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the descriptions. So the division preferences uh, section. So once you open up your your my ERAS, you're going to have a, a drop down, and I, I think uh, for the supplemental years, I think there was eight or nine regions in the in the country, and so you're probably going to have the same thing as what you had in supplemental ERAS. And uh, let's see, so opportunity to communicate your preference or lack of preference uh, for particular geographic divisions, uh, indicate your preference or lack of preference for up to three U.S. Census divisions. If you select a particular division, the only programs located in that division and to which you apply will see your responses. This is really important. So let's say that you, uh, you put California as, or, or the West Coast, however the Census Bureau divides the west coast of the united states let's say you're applying to california programs but you're also applying to new york and you don't want the new york programs to know oh okay so my pre his preference is is california we shouldn't give him an interview only the programs in california 
or in that region, California, probably Arizona, uh, uh, probably Washington as well. So the only, only those programs get to see your, your, your preference for this particular region. Um, now, if you're in California, you're, you have a preference in California, but you have to, you can't just prefer a state, you have to prefer a region. Uh, that doesn't necessarily help you if you're also applying to Washington programs, if, if California is where you want to end up. But overall, all the people, uh, the, the, the programs in that region uh, will probably like that uh, until they speak with you. And so just be be careful. If you if you want California and you have no choice but to apply to, to say, look, I, I prefer this entire region, if you get an interview for Washington, don't focus on California. They, they don't feel that that's the same like it, just because you like california doesn't mean you're gonna like washington so keep that in mind this is a regional preference not a state or a city preference if you select i do not have a, a division preference then all programs to which you apply to will see your responses and if you skip the section then no information will be provided to any programs at all okay pretty pretty self-explanatory um the no preference is actually a selection and um which you literally say i don't have a preference that doesn't mean i don't like it that just means that i don't it's not one over the other that I like more. And so you will have the option to say, look, I like more rural. I like, I, I or I don't like it as much. So you have an option to to do that. And so no, no preferences right there in the middle and you have an option to, to select that. And they want you to explain why you chose that. And um, and you have 300 characters. If you don't know what it feels like to, to write something impressive or, or important and you to deliver your thoughts in, in 300 characters, think again, that's tough. 300 characters is tough, but again, it's about saving time, not giving these programs 25, 26, 30 pages of application, and to just deliver your message in a, you know, as straight line as possible. Uh, let me see if I have this here. I, I, I have kept this piece of paper since, um, <laughs> um, I've kept this for, um, I've kept this for, uh, I'm kind of dating myself, <laughs> for almost three decades. And I learned this in my linguistics class in an undergraduate, and that was in Cal State Fullerton. And um, so I, I was born in Iran, and I was raised there till I was 14, and I came here, and, and so I had to adapt. And so for me, it was a little bit easier. You know, 14 seems to be the the uh, you know the research cutoff time year for for people that can, you know, they they won't lose their accent versus they would, et cetera. So 14 was here. So for me, it wasn't that. I mean, it was tough, but it wasn't as hard as somebody who's like 18, 20, 25 that moves to the U.S. But anyways. What was impressive to me was was it's, it's point A to point B. You see that point A to point B, and it just made so much sense when I saw this. So point A to point B, right? This is United States. How how communication is done in the United States? Uh, this is Asia. Um, you know, Spanish speaking countries. Uh, and so this is point A to point B. When we ask you a question, we want to get the answer immediately. Like we're looking for a straight line. This is what we want to see. But if if we do this in like say Iran. If if I if if you say hi how are you and I say I'm fine and I just stop or I say I'm fine how are you that's probably rude if I don't ask about how your family is doing how's your mom how's your dad how's your brother how's your business if I don't do all of that it may look like I don't have time to speak with you or or for that interaction and and the reverse is true here if we speak like this how's your mom how's your dad or, here in the United States they may say okay what why are you trying to waste time right now. Right? Why can't we get to the point? This is an interview. And so the reason why I say this is because the same way as you have to communicate in, in, in your interview, you can start practicing it here. What a great way to do this, right? Just kind of, you know, brush the dust off your, you know, the brain cells and 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 wake them up, right? Exercise them in in how to communicate and, and try to get from point A to point B as as fast as possible without losing the um, you know the integrity of the uh, the the importance and the, the message you want to go out and carry across. So uh, so yeah so this is for uh, geographical preferences and uh, you get to uh, mention three setting preferences. We uh, the setting preferences section is designed to give the applicants the opportunity to communicate their preference, lack of preference, and the urban or rural setting. And and it looks like there's just two. And uh, you got to describe it again. Three hundred characters. Let's keep moving. All right, since uh, most non-US educational systems do not follow US model, almost all students and graduates of international medical schools will indicate none. The section allows multiple entries for each undergraduate. Okay, so this is, again, this is, uh, I'm happy that ERAS is acknowledging, and I'm not sure how many programs will acknowledge this. I mean, this is a, it's, it's just a sentence here, but uh, most people that look at these applications are, they're just young, they're, they're, they're from the United States, they, they, they think that medical education is just four years. 
Whereas everywhere else in the world is what, five years, five and a half years, six years, seven years, I've seen nine years. And so unfortunately for those that are not familiar with this, that don't see an undergraduate, they may think that, oh, uh, how did this person go to med school right out of high school? That doesn't make any sense. You know, that's just, they're, they're not telling the truth here, or maybe they forgot to fill this out. And so that's what they're talking about here is that there's no undergraduate, but most of the time there's no undergraduate for med school abroad. It's just high school. The first two years of med school is undergraduate. And so quite different than how it is in the U.S. So I'm happy that ERAS is, is acknowledging this. I'm not sure if residency programs all, um, you know, all, we'll, we'll do the same. Uh, okay. So that is the education part. It looks like it's all about the same medical education. Looks like there are no changes. Ah, training. Please have an entry for each of your current or prior training. If necessary, uh, please uh, work with your supervisor to determine an end date for the training. If your program was accredited by AOA when you completed your training, please select the AOA note in the type of training and specialty. All right. Let me, let me tell you something about this. This is not, at least it was not until now, until I actually see the actual ERAS application. I, I, it's not even out yet. This is just a worksheet. But this training is not where you did your internship or residency abroad in up to this year. Again, this year may change, but up to this year, it asked for ACGME programs. And the way that it did it is the program that you select, it will say ACGME accredited. And if you did your residency abroad, it's not ACGME accredited. ACGME is only here in the United States. ACGME International is not ACGME as it is here. ACGME International does not qualify you for state licensure in the US. It's ACGME residency that qualifies you for uh, medical licensure in the US. So this training, be careful, unless they specifically have removed the words ACGME accredited, if they remove that, then this is just for United States. Don't make the mistake of putting in your residency here. This has, this has multiple ramifications if you put your residency training information here. Residency training abroad is not always a positive. Um, residency training in the U.S., if you're applying for residency, is not always a positive either. For example, the program director that I was speaking with right now was regarding a residency re-entry. And so if they see residency here, they may think that you are a re-entry. Usually at a PGY-1 level, you're not going to see this filled. Fellowship, you would, but at a PGY-1, this is almost almost 100% of the time it's empty. And so if you put something in here, you could be sabotaging your application. Um, now, if you have done residency in the US, then you have to put it. You can't omit that fact, uh, which again was the reason why this program director was so pissed off. Uh, not, not because of our doing, but you know, it was on the, the air of the, of, the, um, of the applicant. But um, make sure that, that you don't put it here if you've not done residency. That's what this applicant did. He did residency, PGY-1, in the U.S. and did not fill this out. And the program accepted them, then found out that there was one year residency that was done and they were really pissed off that, that uh, they didn't mention it here. So the reverse is also true. Experiences. Okay, so um, let's see. Options for experience side. You have work, research, volunteer services, advocacy, education, training, military service, other extracurricular activity. Uh, professional organization, uh, teaching, mentoring. Great. I mean, what option you have here, right? You have a lot more options. And I, I, can you all see the, the drop down? The, yeah, yeah I, I think, yeah, you can see it. That, that's, that's good. That's good. Um, so you can define it a lot better. It's not just work, research, volunteer, and that's it, right? How, how tough was it? In the, for those of you that didn't go through the ERAS application before, um, uh, you know, you're, you, you saved a lot of heartache and, and headache, but there's a lot more options here. Uh, so that's really good. Uh, and uh, you have an option. I am currently working in this role. Uh, this is uh, I, this is well, depends on how it's it's uh, realized in the actual application itself. Uh, so uh, you can you know this is to to not have an end date. Start date, end date, state, province, country, city, uh, postal code, zip code. Look at that. You put in a zip code. How often, right? And what are the options here? One time, not returning, daily, recurring. Uh, recurring, monthly, recurring, quarterly, and annually. Interesting. Let's take a look at the settings. Your options are rural, rural or suburban, suburban, suburban or urban, urban and virtual, right? Pretty cool, right? Now you have, if you've done telerotations, live online clinical experiences through us, if you've done um, 
you know, in person, obviously you select all the other ones. And look, if you've done, let's say you did a, a you did a, a, a live online clinical experience and uh, for some reason you just feel like you don't want to say it was, uh, it was a tele-rotation or virtual. Uh, and you, let's say you tell you could mark it as rural because the clinic was rural. That is a misrepresentation because you were not there, you were online. So the appropriate answer here would be virtual, right? If if this is about a telerotation that you did. So select the, the best answer for, the, for what you were involved in rather than where the clinic was involved and you weren't there personally. Primary focus, basic science, clinical uh, translational sciences, community involvement and outreach, customer service, healthcare administration, improving access to healthcare, medical education, music, athletic, art, uh, promoting wellness, public health, quality improvement. Is there one more? And social justice advocacy and technology. Is that it? Yeah, technology. So um, that is the focus of the experience. Is there any field that we missed? No, any other drop, drop downs? No experience type we talked about, position side. Okay, yeah, these are all just text fields. All right, uh, context, role, responsibilities. We talk about this all the time. As I look at letters of recommendation, that's one of the first things I look at, context. What was your role? What was your responsibility? Um, you know, I wanna know why the letter writer is saying these things. And for those letters of recommendation that are just skipping over this and they just talk of, you know, just say a lot of positive sentences and and uh, you were a great team player and you know, uh, um, you're know you the greatest student that they've ever seen. Uh, that's all gone, uh, forget about all that. And so what, uh, what you wanna do is you wanna really think about all of these. And, and this is really good because it's preparing you for the interview because you're gonna be, if they like you, if they like what you wrote here, then you're really kind of doing an interview prep as you're putting this application together. That's how you should really think about it. And 750 character limits, you know? So you got a little bit more space, less than last year, because most of the questions, and previously they weren't asking any of this, uh, most of those uh, were just all in the description. And uh, I think you have like a thousand characters that you could put. So more limit on the characters, uh, less character available because there's more specific questions that are asked. The reason why this is gonna help with the holistic review is because let's say that a program is looking for someone who has this and uh, who has a lot of bad experience. Let's say that they've done daily. And let's say that they're looking for, maybe they're looking for right here, right? Daily, rural, improving access to, uh, to healthcare. Well, this may be, this is going to be appealing to this program University of Mississippi's, remember this, one of the, uh, what were they looking for? They wanted to make sure that that uh, social uh, determinants of health uh, are, are addressed and access to cares uh, is uh, improved. And, you know, so by showing these type of experiences, then, then the programs are gonna be able to match your experiences with their goals and missions uh, a lot better. So that's how they're gonna use it. At least that's how they're supposed to use it. And let's see what happens. So this is the experiences section. Uh, entry three, four, five, all the same, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. And, and I can I can tell you right now what, what's gonna happen. And this happened a lot in the supplemental you asked when we're filling out, uh, because this this it was all optional, right? Whether you want to put one experience, you don't want to put any of the experience, it was the whole thing was optional. It's the same thing with this. Um the the the, the same thing is this is optional. And um it, it's tiring, right? To to think of 10 experiences that you want to talk about and they all have to be consistent and you can't copy and paste from the previous description and put it over here. And so it's gonna get exhausting. Don't procrastinate um, and get help if you need it. We're here, if you need help, if three years of experience with supplemental ERS, you know, over 5,000 members, we, we, know, we know how to help you with this because the most important thing is you gotta make sure that you have a, a hands-on experience with this and you're the one filling this out because you have to support this in the interview. Uh, but start on it as soon as you get your token, get your token immediately and, and make sure you start working on this meaningful experiences that you got to describe and you get 300 characters again, why you pick experience number two, six and 10 as the most meaningful. And then on top of the description you already gave, you're going to have to describe again, why are these the most meaningful to you? Identify and describe up to three of the 10 experiences that you found most uh, meaningful, reflect on experiences, uh, experience why it was meaningful and how it influenced you. Uh, you want to leave in the focus area uh, or the key characteristics you tagged, focus area and key characteristics. What were they? 
focus area was right here. Right, look at that. Focus area, you want to talk about these. And character, key characteristics, what were those? Uh, communication, critical thinking, cultural, empathy. Oh, we didn't even see this. Uh, teamwork, did we? Mm. Self-reflection, resilience, uh, reliability, in integrity, ingenuity, empathy, cultural humanity, uh, critical thinking. So you got to focus on these areas because you're helping the program not have to chase after why you selected these, right? They're making you think about why you're saying certain things. Great. That's fantastic. That's good. It's helping you connect the dots together. So based on those, you want to go in and fill this out. That's a great instruction. And uh, this should not describe what you did in the experience or list the set of skills that you developed or demonstrated. Think about that. And so you can pick experience entry and select it and go on. When time comes, um, we do have services for um, ERS application. For, for those of you that have a residency entry membership or higher analysis and editing of this application, including the new 2024 application is included. So I'll be working directly with you on this application. Impactful experience. This doesn't end. I mean, <laughs> they want you to write a lot because they want to make sure that you're helping the programs see who you are. They want to, they want to get a direct access to your soul and to your values and how you communicate, how's your grammar, what could they potentially expect if they see you in person or even on a virtual interview? So let's take a look at this. Uh, program directors are interested in learning more about uh, other impactful experiences uh, applicants uh, may have encountered uh, or overcome on their journey to residency. Journey to residency. Uh, this section is designed to give the applicants the opportunity to provide additional information about their background uh, or life experiences that is not captured elsewhere in the application. So not only do you have to think about those 10 plus three 13 different descriptions on top of all that again optional you don't have to do it if you don't want to you got to think about now an impactful experience and it cannot be any of the same as you had before or maybe it was during one of those 10 but it's got to be a different angle that you view it as from Okay, this is interesting. Okay, so back to the capture. Okay, so for example, information written in this section should not be in the same as what is indicated in your personal statement. So if you were thinking, well, you know, I'm just going to go to focus a lot on my personal statement and I'm going to go ahead and take some of that and I'm going to talk about it here. They're telling you, don't do that. So um, clever, right? If, if you were a residency program, you would want this level of attention put and by the applicant in their application before you go ahead and give this coveted interview to them, right? And because you want people that have, they know about themselves, right? It's not just about, you know, why do you want to be an internist? Well, because, uh, you know, I've always wanted to be a physician. Well, that's just, that's just, you know, that just, <laughs> it's not exciting. It's just, that's not the type of person I want to have in my residency, right? Because you're going to be my teacher to other students that are coming in. I want you to impress them with who we are. Right. So the first thing that you got to do, you got to learn about yourself and what got you here and what's, what it is that you're bringing into this program. So this is what this is supposed to do. Clever. Uh, please consider whether. And by the way, this was all in supplementary. Else, I'm not I'm, I'm just surprised that it's all as one. And I'm just surprised that now it's a part of my ERS and it's and everybody's going to now have to do it. OK, so please describe any challenges or hardships that influenced your journey to residency against stay positive. This could include experiences uh, related to your family, background, financial, community setting, educational experiences. Um, and, and like, for example, your clinical experiences. What else? So we didn't even talk about this. So for those of you that are focusing on your clinical experiences, and all of you should be. Um, all of you should be thinking about your U.S. clinical experiences. Uh, don't look at this as an opportunity to not now not do U.S. clinical experiences and just talk about all the things you've done abroad. We need a balance of it and, and not too much balance, you know, weighing in on, on, on experiences abroad. Maybe one of the 10, maybe two of the 10 experiences could be about those abroad. The other ones have to be those. Strongly recommend that, I, that those are surrounding clinical experiences. So the challenge that I see with this, the, 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 the pitfall in, in this entire process is it's very easy for you to now forget or, or try to minimize the significance of U.S. clinical experience, because now you may think, well, there's just so many things that have happened in my life that I can talk about those. Maybe now I don't have to just give a chronological order of, of events in, in, in my U.S. clinical experiences. And that will be the wrong way to think about this. 
what I would do if I were you, let's say, do, do not change. The fundamentals are the same. The fundamentals are the five, four, three, two, one rule. This stands. There's, there's nothing has changed here. You, you got to do your five months of clinical experience in the United States. You got to have your four U.S. letters of recommendation, not three, four strong ones. That means you got to shoot for five. Hopefully you end up with four strong ones. You know, you got to dedicate three months to preparing your ERAS application. Look how challenging this is going to be. Oh, I'm sorry. Three months to audition rotations before September, right? Because if you do auditions afterwards and you're relying on those to get interviews, well, what if you get a rejection from those auditions before your rotation even started, right? And and that's a challenge that you want to, you don't, you don't want to have to deal with. And then um, dedicate two months to MSP, ERAS, personal seminar. I, I, now that I see this application, I, I want to change that to at least, I would probably say, let me see, June, see, July, August, September. Yeah, so this is, you're going to need every day of, of um, you know, as soon as your token is released, you're going to need every day of it to, 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 to get this application. This is a beast. Uh, two months uh, and then MSPE, that's going to take a long time. Uh, personal statement, that's going to take, a, and, and none of the stuff you talk about in your personal statement is going to have to be in the impactful experiences. Yeah, so so you need you need that's gonna have to change to three months, and then um, you got to speak to one specialty. That's gonna make your life a lot easier. Now, could you imagine if you if you're applying to three specialties, or that's what you were thinking of doing because you thought that's gonna improve your chances? It doesn't. It drops your chances significantly of both securing interviews and uh, and matching. Uh, if you're thinking about multiple specialties, this should hopefully seal the deal for you. You don't have time to show your commitment to more than one specialty. Pick one. Do your clinicals, uh, your clinicals around that specialty. Focus your letters of recommendation around that specialty. Allow the experiences that you gain from that one specialty um, to be the uh, your guiding light, your um, you know your driving force where you get your energy from, and 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 have your entire application based around that. And you're not going to regret it. You're going to thank us. Um, and that's that's how this whole system is is set up. The, and you got to have all of these done. Now we say September first. You really have up till the twenty sixth. Uh, but when I say that, then everybody just kind of waits until the 25th. And so you got to have all these done by September 1st. And by the way, plan on your letter writers not giving you the letters, not uploading the letters, not writing the letters. So you got to deal with these a lot farther in advance. And that's why if right now, May 25th, you got to have your clinical set up right now if you haven't done any of them. Or if you don't have by now, if you don't have two or three letters of recommendation for this upcoming match, um, that's that's an issue like you, you got to jump on this urgently uh because june july uh, th these are pretty much your your final months that you can go through this without that much stress as soon as you get into august and september and if you are hoping that a september or a august a clinical experience is going to be enough and just one letter of recommendation you're not going to be happy with the outcomes if, if that letter doesn't come through and then there goes your entire uh your plans so this five four three two one rule applies and so have that as the foundation and and use those experiences and talk about those a lot because if you don't and the programs are looking for us experiences and and acgme core competencies and your 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 application is not going to is not going to pass the holistic review okay if they're looking for if they're looking for let's say they're their family medicine if they're looking for let's say they're looking for self and inflection and improvement and you don't have any uh letters of recommendation that talks about which areas you improve let's say you have letters that say really impressive things about you but not a single thing that you improved on where you came in you weren't that strong in, but you improved on it let's see none of that happened well, then, then that that's a problem, right? And uh, and so just know that. And so so give the programs what they're looking for. So as great as this application is, this is what I was saying that it's a it's a double edged sword. Um, I just I I just know that some people are going to just focus completely on their foreign experiences, and and this is really going to backfire. So don't change the five four three two one. Don't change your need for five months of clinical experiences. I'm telling you, I'm begging you, don't do that. Um, that is going to be your big, biggest savior. That's what's going to give content to your uh, your entire application. You're going to need a lot of content. You're going to need a lot of experiences to talk about. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to spend any more time on this. Uh, licensure, uh, additional, was your medical education? Oh, my goodness. Yes. <sighs> okay. For those of you that took a few months off while you were in med school um, and you don't think it was a big deal, uh, and for those of you that took a few years off, whether it was you know intentional or not, don't put no over here if you've had if you've had any break in your medical education. 
And and for those of you that are chatting, yes, absolutely, I will, I will, I will, one hundred percent, I will, I will respond to your chats, and I and I really appreciate y'all typing. Just keep them coming, keep the chats coming, and we're, we're going to get there. Uh, and so, if, if th this is important, gap in medical education is not something which you believe whether it's a gap or not, right? Gap is how long does it take? How long is the program designed to be completed? I mean, this is this is just this is published information. Let's say you go to World Directory of Medical Schools. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. I need to put just maybe a minute on on this conversation because this is a. As soon as we see this and somebody says no, and we know how long it takes for, um, let's say, let's let's uh, let's just go over here, and I'm just gonna search and uh, look at this program. Look at this curriculum duration: six years. There's four things that they talk about on program. One of them is duration. This is important. So if it took you six years and three months, you need to explain those three months. Don't be afraid. Don't think as soon as we're going to go out and see a no over here, we're going to be impressed. Well, we'll be impressed if your entire application supports a no over here. But, you know, think about it. I mean, we're not these people looking at your application. They're pretty professional. Our job is to just sniff out problems. And I'm not going to do a single second of a holistic review, and neither are any of my colleagues, if we see that one, even one part of your application was misrepresented. And so if I look over here and you have a no here, for example, and you say no here, and I count, I literally, I like everything else about your application. I'm just going to do a random check and I'm going to count the number of months between when you started med school, when you ended it. I just want to see if you pass that little test. And if I see that those numbers don't add up to what I am familiar with in your country or your medical school, that's it. It's done. That's not impressing me at all. Now, if you had, let's say a three month gap, I don't care, one month gap and you you believe and you want to go ahead and just and disclose it, you can do this. Maybe it was completely acceptable. Maybe it was a leave of absence that your school approved. Write it down. Write it down. I would much rather work with somebody that is that is not afraid of telling me the truth, right? And and tells me like it is and what happened in the background because we're all human. We've all gone through trials and tribulations. Just you know, have the confidence to say, yes, this happened. This is the reason why it happened. And if they're going to give you an interview, you disclose that they're giving you an interview because they like your candidness. They like your accountability. They like your transparency. That is good. That's what you want. You want to be in a program like that, that they're not going to come back at you. Let's say you make a mistake in residency. If we make a mistake in residency, the first place, and, and like, it's something that we're like, well, this just doesn't make sense. This is not the person I interviewed. Guess what's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to go right here to your application. And we're going to try to find something wrong in this application. Right? We're going to try to find something wrong in this application because if I find something wrong here and I can say, okay, well, you know what? Look, I had a trust issue with you in person and you did the same thing here in your application. I have a case against you. I cannot have a person like that. I can't give them patience, right? Because if they, if I, if I lose my trust one time, that's it. I can't lose trust even once. And so don't lower your standards. That's the standard you should have when you're filling out this application. Be honest. And if you're worried that you're not going to get the interviews, I would much rather you not get the interview and, and, and not have to go through the misery of losing that position than to get interviews from less programs, but they've seen it and they've justified, okay, you know what? There's more good than, than, than issues. Let's bring this person in. That's who you want to be interviewed by. Um, all right. Licensure. This is a U.S. license, medical license, not um, aesthetics, not uh, engineering. This is... U.S. medical license, not a license abroad, U.S. medical license. Uh, and for those of you who have like a physician, uh, I'm assistant physician license. So where we, what we did, and, and, I'm, and I'm a lot of programs do, when we see a license here and, and the person is applying a PGY-1, it's a telltale sign that this person is a re-entry. May not be, right? It, it may be completely legit. I mean, re-entry is legit, but it may be a completely okay, benign situation that they had. They were an assistant physician. They had a license, they had to work and anyways. But if we see that, the first thing that comes to our mind is they went to residency, they had to have a training license, they're disclosing it here. Maybe I should just stop looking at this because I can handle you know, the drama of, of somebody who was a re-entry resident. And, and not all the re-entry residents are drama, by the way. FYI, you, this is a fantastic opportunity for you to 
um, to make yourself look like a drama-free individual, right? But a drama-free individual is somebody that hides things, is about somebody that addresses it, discloses it, but also addresses it. So don't overstate, don't understate, just make sure that you state uh, what is there, but also know how it's gonna be interpreted um, by, by the programs. This part right here, another source of, um, of, of cause for, um, you know, for, for a lot of headaches uh, for, for, for candidates and programs, it's clearly saying, are you able to do the job even if there's zero accommodations made available to you? I'm going to, you know, lately, I've, I've, I don't know why, but I've um, spoken with a lot more individuals that um, have had protection under the Americans with Disabilities Act while they were in medical school. And what medical school did is they, for example, extended, they gave them more time to do their clinical rotations. They gave them more time to do the exams, um, which again, I get it 100%, uh, I get that. It's not the way it is in the residency. And this is, this, this is a direct indication of it. They wanna know if there's no accommodations made for you, are you able to carry out the job? So if you start residency and then you demand that the in-training exam be just for you, be extended over two to three days, um, don't think that they're gonna be as, as nice as they were back in medical school. Um, and so think really, really hard about the transition that you're making from undergraduate medical education to graduate medical education. If there's truly an issue, if there's truly a reason why you cannot carry out the duties, let's say, for example, there's a, where there's a, there's a let's say there's a true disability, right? Let's say, let's say I have, a, I have an amputated right arm. Do I have to disclose that? Uh, yes, I would. If this is a surgery program I'm applying to, maybe I don't have to disclose that if this is family medicine, right? You know, I mean, the, the, the examples go on and on, but if you're going to say yes to this and um, and then later on you request accommodations, uh, that really upsets the programs because they say, look, if you needed accommodations, you should have told us that here, because when we look at this, we're going to decide whether this is what we want to deal with or not. So think very long and hard about the accommodations, if any were made for you um, in med school, in any other environments, even in a previous residency program, and think longer hard whether you're going to say yes or no to this uh, and what this could do uh, for your program. So I'm not saying don't say yes if you really need it. I'm saying say yes if you need it and be able to explain it. And it better be a good reason why you want one. If you need longer time because of ADHD to take an exam, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope that's truly, truly an, an issue because you know I'm not sure if the if the boards uh, like the American Board of Family Medicine is really going to be as as lenient. Uh, and for, for for a lot of individuals that have, you know, asked for extra time from USMLE and uh, and and how many of them have gotten rejected? That that should tell you. Now there are some that do get accepted, right? They do they do provide them additional time. But there's you know the 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 your your responsibility to to prove that is very very high. So they're gonna it's gonna be really a true um, disability that that requires attention. And again, not all of them are deal breakers. I just want to make sure that you're transparent and you think about everything that you're presenting to these programs very carefully. Uh, this is important, especially for those of you who have uh, been a re-entering resident, and maybe if you're re-entering, maybe the dismissal was because of a lawsuit, a uh, malpractice, and so this needs to be explained. Uh, have you ever been, there you go, have you ever been, oh, look at that, okay. Uh, man, this is just, for those of you that are doing clinical experiences with no insurance, I repeat, if you're coming in contact with patients, you're not an employee of that clinic, or you're an employee of the clinic, you have a title of medical assistant, but you're doing everything that a physician is doing. If you're calling yourself a physician, if you're calling yourself a doctor, going into seeing patients and you're thinking you're just doing an observership or an externship, if you think the insurance of the physician is gonna cover you because you're an observer there, if you think nothing is gonna happen, think again. These questions come up, there are lawsuits, I spoke with a with an attending physician yesterday, and um, and he thinks that there is going to be a, a a malpractice coming in. And and one of our rotators was was in in getting a clinical experience. And thankfully, we have professional liability insurance. But for those of you that are just you know trying to save a few bucks and getting these clinical experiences and thinking it's all going to be okay, holistic review means holistic review. That means we're going to find out, we're going to get into details, and you're going to have to explain things. You're going to have to be accountable, and you're going to have to understand the the the, the 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 gravity and the impact of the decisions that you've made and um and 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 you gotta and this all shows that you know what you're being a part of 
And so um, there you go. Uh, have you ever been named in a lawsuit? And and everybody, whether you're an IMG medical student, anybody, anybody can get get uh, uh, become a part of malpractice lawsuit. If you're in, if you come in front of a patient, you can be sued. And it's not just at that point; you could be sued ten years later. And professional liability insurance gives you that tail coverage to to um, just in case that happens to protect you. Another big mistake that a lot of medical graduates are being tricked into is that some insurance agents are selling them medical student professional liability insurance and calling them all medical students you're not a student medical student professional liability insurance is like you know it's like a you know a renter's insurance for a house and you're looking for car insurance two completely different things just because it's both you know ultimately everybody's going to become doctors it doesn't make it uh, appropriate and that's and and you don't want to find out that you have the wrong insurance at that point so anyway just letting you know that these are the times that these decisions that you have to make and now you have to disclose it all and if you have if you're not in that situation great you have an opportunity to do it right hopefully you'll consider ac medical for the clinical experiences that you need hopefully you'll consider us uh for your entire application preparation and if and if not um you know hopefully you'll find somebody that uh that can help you uh, if there's anything in your past that would limit your ability to be licensed look at that again here you go uh, or would limit your ability to receive a hospital privileges I'm telling you, if you don't have tail coverage, this could limit you from getting hospital privileges. Hands down, ask anyone. If you have to disclose to a state medical board, I'm, I'm going through that right now. And, and individuals having a tough time getting a uh, license in a state because they miscategorize their observership as a clerkship. I, I don't know what they did. I don't know what they did in the application, but this is these are the areas that it comes up. And if you say no here and you don't know what you're saying no to, uh, you know, you're, you're, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a sabotaging of, of all this hard work that you're doing. Uh, so pay attention to these sections. This, this is as important as you taking your USMLE exams. Have you ever been convicted of a misdemeanor in the United States? Any felonies in the United States? Uh, board certified. This doesn't apply to you. DA registration number. You would know it if you have it. Publications, research. You know, this is pretty self-explanatory. I don't think that there's any changes here. Uh, and so we're going to skip right through that. And notice, notice, uh, before we used to think that there's three things that matter in ERAS application and in my entire life, work, volunteer, research. So we literally thought research was equal weight in importance as clinical experience. And now the truth comes out. And because program directors, depending on the specialty, research is not that important to all of them. It's pretty low on the to in the total pool. Um, and so now you can see it because now your experience is you have, there's just so many more options you can talk about. So hopefully you're seeing the writing in the ball and, uh, and, and shift your attention to practical experiences. So you have content for, um, your application. All right. Other activities. We're almost at the end. Poster presentation, oral presentation, non-peer, uh, pro okay. Program signaling. There you go. So, uh, you pick your program, signal them, you know, the numbers and use the space below to note the ACGME ID and program name for participating programs you wish to signal within each specialty uh, to which you plan to apply. Participating programs will be available by July. Okay, so this is just your own worksheet that you type in, you know, so to kind of get you get have a heads up, uh, you have some time to, um, you know, you have some time to, uh, to put this application together. So if you're gonna be signaling seven internal medicine programs, uh, so you have some time to uh, research them. Uh, but you know, most people uh, are going to be applying. They have to apply. If there's like one or two red flags in your application, every red flag you got to add like 100, 150 programs to your to the to the, the to your budget of applying to programs. But you you want to make sure that you're investing in the right application. So your first investment has to go over here, and then this dictates how the rest of the things go. But the best thing you can do, I'm gonna I sound like a broken record. Proper clinical experiences and recent ones addresses almost every issue in the CRS application. You're going to be thrilled that you followed that direction. It's not because I work at AC Medical. It's because it's the fact. That's how residency is based. It's all about clinical experience, about clinical rotation. That's what it's about. So do that right, and you'll be able to fill this application properly. And of course, we'll guide you through it. And that is the end of this application. All right. So just for uh, sake of time. I am going to jump over here to your questions and just make sure that we've addressed these. Actually, before I do that, 
if there's anybody here that has uh, if if there's anybody here that wants to ask their question and uh, you know they want me to you want to unmute yourself and you want to raise your hand and, and ask me the question you can I welcome that I will uh, I will now go through the chat and see if there's any questions over here that uh, we need to answer so we'll start from the top yep so the new format does seem a lot better a lot more detailed all right so in the experiences section do we go from most recent first to uh, most old ones it doesn't matter you should think of it that way it doesn't matter to the program because they can you know they're really uh, they can sort it in, in different ways but uh, it's really that we're looking at the, at the at the bulk of the type of experiences that you pick uh, and that's where it's you know it's it's good for those with a, with a big gap in their background it's also not good for those individuals because now you may not have the opportunity to talk about all that gap. maybe you got to talk about the gap in impactful experiences and maybe when you talk about it in impactful experiences you just barely touch on it in your personal statement or vice versa a lot to think about okay and uh, it seems we can enter our in-person and virtual clinical experience that's right you absolutely can you can enter both of those and now you can categorize them properly uh, next question is the msb sent over to eras by your medical school medical school sends it to ecfmg if you're from a foreign medical school if they participate in the electronic communication with ecfmg uh, if they don't, you upload your your your, your MSPE through Oasis in ACGM in ECFMG's uh, in your portal. If you're a U.S. medical student, then the medical school directly uploads it into ERAS uh, and uh, and it's available. And and MSPEs can replace the previous ones. And there's not a wait period um, until today. Uh, everything I'm saying can change, uh, but until today, there's not been a wait period. Uh, so if your school does not participate in the electronic communication and your school can tell you, then you can upload your own MSP. Uh, what is an audition month? Audition is a, a lot of medical students in the United States take advantage of that. And it's so it's a, it's a one level above a sub internship. So you have your core clerkships in the six specialties of, of you know, core medicine, which is, you know, family, OBGYN, pediatric surgery, uh, psych and OBG, internal medicine. So those are the six cores. So those are cores. Then you do electives. Elected, which is about half the length of your course, but it's an entire academic year. That is your opportunity to do a repeat of the specialty you're interested in that you're applying to. So then, you know, you would do a repeat of internal medicine, for example, uh, but four weeks this time. And then when you repeat internal medicine again, remember, you need four letters of recommendation. That's why you got to repeat these. You do, you repeat it again, but this time you do a sub internship. Sub internship is one level above that. You don't want to jump right into sub internship as your first clinical experience in the U.S. That's going to be tough because you're going to be expected to like perform as a as an intern. Like that's that's why it's called a sub I. Um, it's not a rotation with a private practitioner, right? That's so that's so. Then you have audition. Audition is not just a sub I, but an audition. You're expressly telling the program, "I am applying to your program." It's kind of like a signal, but it's an in-person signal times four weeks. It could be a week, it could be two weeks, it could be four weeks. The ones that we offer are four weeks, but it is meant to uh, improve your chances of getting an interview. But if they give you an interview, it's solid. Like they know who you are, they know your, your performance, they know you dedicated four weeks of your time to go there. So you, you're, you're okay with being there. They know how you act. It's just a really, really, it's an in-person version of the application that you saw here times four weeks. And and so med students in the United States do have done that for decades. And we started offering auditions to our medical graduates. And and so it's been quite incredible. Uh, I spoke with a program director in South Miami and half of his incoming 10 residents, half of them are from AC Medical and all of them are those that did audition with him. And he's actually thinking of just doing away with with uh, with the, the match and, and rank order list and just picking from those that auditioned with them and and this is a it's a trend that we're seeing in not just one or two programs in, in a lot of places that the harder it becomes to to evaluate an eras application the more those in-person experiences with decision makers makes a difference but also be careful don't be um you know don't don't talk yourself into a, a just a private clinic rotation being a sub i i've seen a lot of caribbean medical schools do that to their med students uh, and they they put them with a private practitioner and the private practitioner is really tough. It's a great experience. And they call it a sub I because, you know, you put someone on call. That's not a sub I, uh, you know, that's sub I is directly with the residency program. Audition is directly with the residency program. It's not just with one person, right? Everybody knows you're there, you're processed properly. The program director has accepted you. There's, you know, it's pretty formal. What about letters of recommendation from last cycle? Can we use one to two of them? No. 
don't do it. Two reasons. M number one, we use the date and the context and when that experience took place that is mentioned in the letter of recommendation to gauge when was your last patient contact. If you use a letter of recommendation from last year, two years ago, you're telling me you haven't had recent experience or you haven't found somebody that is trusting you to allow you to do clinical experience. And so any experience that is older than 18 months from when July residency starts. So not 18 months from today, 18 months from July 1, 2024, right? So we're already 12 months out, you gotta take 12 months out of it. So any experience from today and six months ago, anything past that you should not use as, as the basis for your letter of recommendation, as a basis for you saying, I have recent experience in the United States. So take January forward, any experience, any letter, anything from January forward, great. Anything before January, December and past, it's, by the time you, it's just going to be outdated. So yeah, I'm assuming gap in medical education is not the same as gap in medical profession. Good, good question. Gap in medical profession would be after you graduate. I'm assuming that's what you're asking. So there's two gaps you got to worry about the gap while you were a medical student from when you started to when you finished. And how does that compare to how long it's supposed to take you to graduate? And then you have a gap after you graduated. And normally what is somebody in your position supposed to do? Well, you know, maybe in your country, you were supposed to do internship after internship, you were supposed to, you know, then, then be a general practitioner, or you were supposed to go to residency and maybe you didn't, you came to the United States, maybe you got married, who knows? And so they want to know about that gap too. Most of the gaps are post-graduation. Uh, minority of the gaps are, are during medical school. Both of them are, are, are critical for the purposes of ERAS. They're asking the question about, has there been a gap in your medical education? They're talking about gap while you were in medical school and if you've gone to residency in the U.S. or fellowship in the U.S., they want to know whether there was a gap there. So they consider residency in the U.S. as medical education. They consider medical education period as anywhere in the world as 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 also the 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 uh, the, the, the first place that they look for for gap. So either in residency in the U.S., fellowship in the U.S. If you took if, it, if you took like let's say um, uh, let's say uh, residency is three years, right? And it took someone. Uh, so right now, down in 36 months, it took somebody 38 months to graduate. We immediately have a problem with that uh, because as soon as we know somebody's taken longer, then we know it was either they were off cycle or they were probably put on probation. There was a leave of absence. Uh, not that we should not take a leave of absence, but it's just frowned upon in residency. And that's something that the Coalition for Position Accountability addressing, I think they're going to have a tougher time with with changing those type of behaviors. But I mean, they've, they've shocked me with, with how much changes have happened in the past two years, starting with pass fail of step one and now complete change of my ERAS, my goodness. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, uh, you know, they're gonna systematically uh, deal with those. But for now, yeah, any any sort of gap is is frowned upon. And, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I, I already said in the beginning of the presentation, life happens. Uh, not all of these gaps are bad. But I do have a problem with applications that ignore those gaps or they think it's okay and they can just, you know, not talk about it. I want to make sure that you're comfortable in your own skin and you can talk about it. And I want to know whether I want to be the one that judges whether it's a problem or not. I just don't like surprises. Nobody likes surprises uh, in a supervisory role. So does an extension of 11 days in internship need to be declared? You know, my, my question to you, would, well, in, in, internship, does that mean in the U.S. or does that mean abroad? I think that's the first question I have, because usually internship abroad is a part of your medical education. 11 days, it doesn't sound like it's a problem, but I, I just wonder why was there even a gap? You know, 11 days, what happened? So, but probably not a big deal uh, because you probably still graduated the, the same. You didn't have to have a longer duration to graduate, but if it impacted, like you didn't walk with the rest of the class and uh, with your cohort, then then it's, we got to just talk about it. I'm not saying you have to put it, but it's something to talk about. What about work experience as medical assistant or scribe? Will that be okay? Well, I mean, if you feel that that's one of the experiences you will need to include as one of the 10, you get 10 slots, right? It's like applying to 45 programs in SOAP. If you want to dedicate one of those 10 to, you know, being a medical assistant or, or being a typist, fine. Allow me to just ask you a question. Passive experience is very, very different than active experience. Being a scribe is a passive role because you're supposed to type exactly what the physician says 
into the EMR. That's the job of a scribe, period. Medical assistants are not supposed to independently make decisions for patients. Whereas as a clinical experience or as a, a rotator in a clerkship, you're supposed to discuss what your assessment plan action is going to be repetitively for multiple patients back to back to back as if you were in an actual clinical setting, not to the patient, but to the attending physician. If you were a scribe and a medical assistant and you were doing all of that, then my question would be, why were you doing all of that? Because if you were a medical assistant and you were doing an assessment and plan and assisting with exams and bringing the patients back and doing a history, all the stuff that a medical student does. If you were doing all of that, then that is outside your job description or what that state medical board allows a medical assistant to do. And if that's the case, then were you really supposed to do all of that? And if you're going to talk about that in your ERAS application, then you're literally taking a spotlight and you put it in on things that should not have happened. If you were a scribe and you were doing, and you were interacting with the patients and coming in contact with them, again, that's outside your job description as well. And so you see how this application can be used against you. So now if you, if this was your position, if you can somehow tie this into ACGME core competencies, and it's not outside of your job description, and you, you didn't do things that you know, a physician does, and you didn't call yourself a doctor, and you didn't have assessment and plans, and if you didn't do all that, then, then I'll, I'll be okay with that. But I'm, I'm always worried about MAs and scribes making those experiences look residency relevant because just functionally, they're not. Taking vitals is not understanding patient care. A medical assistant is not supposed to come up with orders or a nurse even, they're supposed to execute it. Whereas with a medical student, resident, a physician, we're supposed to think about those and come up with those orders and come up with those plans and make sure that everybody else executes it. So very, very different roles. And if you try to make one look like the other, then you're, you're screaming that I don't understand what I'm, what I'm expected to do or how I was supposed to prepare. Let me see signaling. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you just, you literally identify programs that you want to tell them, look, I'm, I'm super interested in you and you signal, you put the programs number, the, the, uh, the ACGME ID number, and you, you have a, a quota of, of how many programs you can signal, let's say seven and you signal them and they literally receive your signal. So that's, that's in a nutshell, that's what it is. Let's see. The next question is. Uh, I'm an IMG old year graduation, uh, and one of the one of the first things I recommend is, look, uh, the only thing that makes you an old graduate is not when you graduated from medical school. It's the way your application reads. And so, if your application is going to feel aged, and every experience that I see there is going to be about 1999 or 2001, and and nothing that is residency relevant from today, next month all the way till 2024. If I don't see that, I don't care when you graduated, this is an outdated applicant. And, um, and that's what we have a problem with. But anyways, like I'm an old graduate, right? I mean, but I would never introduce myself like that, right? Because I feel like I'm completely up to date. Uh, so practically speaking, which specialty is least competitive so that uh, in the second cycle I am applying, uh, I can, uh, I can focus. Look, uh, do this, do a free consult, like let, let me and you speak, you don't have to talk right now but just sign up, go to try us for free and let's just talk. And, and let me just understand your red flags from my perspective, because I don't think your problem is just the specialty. You're, you're, you, the, you shouldn't be looking at the lowest barrier to entry because surprise, every single specialty is the most competitive you could imagine. There's not a specialty that is not competitive. It doesn't exist. So you have to go in with the same level of tenacity and resilience and expectation that you're you're entering the war as if you whether you're probably psychiatry family or internal and that's not the way you should be looking at your application if you got to change the way you think so hopefully you'll do that so you and i can speak because there is that's a that's not even the right way to look at your your your, your candidacy okay and let me see as an img okay i see this one thing it did not impact oh, okay i think this is about the 11 days i, I it sounds like it's okay i don't i don't uh, i don't have enough information but you don't have to tell me what the 11 days was uh, was for, but it's just weird. You know, 11 days, that's probably not a big deal. Maybe you're overthinking it. So, uh, okay. And then final question here, as an IMG with no connections with any region, uh, do you recommend putting geographical preference, no preference? 
No, I think that you should take advantage of this. I think that uh, here, geographical preferences, if you don't put any preference and you're an IMG, what first thing I'm thinking is maybe you don't have clinical experiences or you think you're going to go through the match and you'll be okay without recent clinical experiences. Or maybe you do have clinical experiences. You just didn't know you can use where those are located as your geographical preferences. Um, and so if you have recent clinical experiences or you have in short set up properly, if you have those coming up, then you can use those clinics. And if they're in person, you can do, use the location of those as the basis for the region where you're applying to. And what a great way to, to kind of talk about where your, you know, your, your clinical experiences are. So if you're not allowed to give unlimited per logically ordered uh, experiences in my ERAS, well, what they're really wanting to see is geographical preferences. Let's say, I don't know, East Coast, let's say the Atlantic region, which was Georgia. Description, why? Because when I was doing my family medicine clinical experience in Atlanta with Morehouse Family Medicine and Dr. You know Mizani and and uh, you know and, and when we did some house calls with the, with the patients, I you know the, uh, uh, the, the 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 culture they resonated with me. I felt like I was back at home. It was a, a suburban area. You know, just you know, I, I really enjoyed being there. And so now you're tying in your experience in clinical experiences, you're talking about your family of experience in Atlanta, you're given a date, you're given context, you're tying it all together, you're, you're geographically preferring uh, that area for a good reason, then you can signal programs in that geographical area. When they look at it, they're gonna see Georgia all over the place, they're gonna see Atlanta, and they're gonna love it, right? And they're gonna see a type of experience that they're looking for, done. See, that's what we says now, but if you don't have any of that, what are you gonna do? You're gonna talk about the day that you went to Disneyland, the three days you were in Anaheim, and and uh, man, do I have to talk about that geographical preference? Now I, I don't have anybody else there. No, that's why I'm telling you, clinical experiences will solve the majority of your problems. It will solve the majority of your problems. A lot of these issues that we have, I'm telling, it's that simple. It is that simple. Proper clinical experiences will solve almost all the problems here, and they got to be done recently, in short, and enough of it, and. 80% of your issues are gone. And the good things about it is that you're you're going to be able to address a lot of your red flags because of these experiences, because deep down inside, we forgive. We want to treat you as we want to be treated, right? We get that. And so if you allow for that to happen, then you're in good shape. All right. So we are done here. If, uh, if there are any questions that I did not answer um, and you want to have answered, please go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, I'm just going to go, I'm going to probably just put five minutes over here and and see if there's any questions that we should talk about. Okay, token, it depends whether you're US or international. Um, uh, US medical students are gonna get it uh, early June. International medical students and graduates is gonna be end of June. IMGs, you get it, go to ECFMG, US medical seniors, you go directly to your dean's office. Applying the second time, free consult. Uh, I think that's the best thing I can tell you because there's just so much to it. Do I list research experience that I didn't end up in a publication? How do I explain not completing it, oh, what a great question. Look, uh, maybe that, that what you thought was that important is not that important because now you've got to kind of talk about it. Now, if you did it and it was a substantial work and it wasn't just like, you know, a day or two a month, you signed up for, you know, with a, with a company that, you know, that they, they're, they're putting 20 other people, they're just tagging them back to back to back onto this one research and, you know, they charge you 600 bucks. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't talk about that. You know, maybe you shouldn't talk about that. So it really has to do with what kind of research it was. I mean, if it was a CDC, for example, and you were a legit research associate and it was just a huge, huge study that you just didn't get to finish. Yeah, you talk about that and you didn't have publication, but there's really good reason why you got a publication because it was just, you know, 500,000 participants in this research and, you know, and you were just not there for 10 years. So it just, it just all depends. All right, let me go ahead and we have somebody that has raised your hand. All right, DG, um, be, please unmute yourself. Uh, thanks for raising your hand. Hi, Dr. Mizani. Thank you for this information. Oh, my so pleasure. About the, uh, yeah, about this research experience that didn't end up in a publication. Uh, for example, one of the experiences I had was with the DHPE CDC program after my MPH, and this was with American Lung Association. Now, this was an internal, I would say, um, uh, for example, a study which we did in Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. And this resulted in an internal kind of generation of a manuscript and a report, but not necessarily a journal research, I would say, right? So should I be mentioning about this? 
I think that uh, I think there is other publication that you can uh, use here. Uh, let's see. If there was something that was published as a result of that work, I think you should try to, and you were a part of it, I think you should try to give yourself credit for it. Let's see, other article, there we go. Maybe you can fit it on it here. Uh, maybe online publication, you can put it there. Yeah, so maybe other articles, maybe you can, and then you just describe it. And as long as it's not a misrepresentation, and this is other is like, you know, don't get, mm -hmm. don't get caught off guard with this word other, uh, try to kind of fit it in here. That's where I would probably put it. So uh, this also holds true, for example, if I worked with the state health department and I generated a report and did a study within the department and generated a report for use by the department, then should I be mentioning the, all those things as well? I, I, I would, but, but I would probably switch it up a little bit and, and maybe put that under oral presentation. If you did, like, say, you talked about hypertension in front of two other medical students and the attending, that's not an oral presentation. Yeah. But if you yeah. presented a report to a panel of experts, yeah this this that counts okay and then one last question because i'm this is really important i guess uh for example 20 years ago in military initiated a research at high altitude but because there were no and this is in a um, like back home in india but the, at that time we are not working with any uh, research protocol or rules and regulations around that so the research was initiated data was collected by me but then eventually the research was i went on for a leave and the research was moved to another uh, medical officer so by the time i come uh, come the research was already sent without me doing the analysis uh, and of course no publication so what should i do about such things i mean i have a supervisor who's who knows that you know i have initiated the research they in fact wrote about it in a letter of recommendation for my public health but uh, there's no publication and um, i can't claim like, may i stop you yes please <laughs> sure the way i'm feeling right now so i always i always play devil's advocate mm -hmm. i play program how would they feel as i'm listening to you and mm -hmm. i play mizani how do i deal with this mm -hmm. As I'm hearing what you're saying, I feel more and more distant from you as a residency program. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I don't understand, like, I don't even care what happened 20 years ago that you're explaining this to me. Mm -hmm. To you, it may matter a lot mm -hmm. because you think that, look, it was a, it's a part of my life. I want to talk about that. I have research experience and I don't want to miss that opportunity. To me, I'm like, okay, well, let me see what your letters of recommendation look like from right now. Mm -hmm. And if they look good, maybe I don't really care about what happened 20 years ago. Got it. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you should think. Okay. And and I go with that gut feeling all the time, which is the reason why I stopped you, not because I disrespect what you did. Oh, I want no, you to okay. rethink your mm -hmm. approach to this because that's probably not an experience you even need to talk about, okay. especially now that you're you have 10. It's mm -hmm. not unlimited. You don't have to talk about everything that happened in your life. Mm -hmm. No, you pick 10 that you want the interview to focus on. You want to talk about 10 that is going to get you that interview be smart with the 10 topics you want to talk about mm -hmm. do you think talking about an experience where we stopped halfway and there was a supervisor and you have to explain why it, and it was mm -hmm. two decades do you think that's going to get you an interview no then then don't waste another second on it mm -hmm. got it mm -hmm. understand great questions thank you for sharing that yeah all right let's see um what is a frida and match a resident and uh how do we use them both well? Uh, okay, so Frida, this is actually a really good question. Uh, Frida is a service of American Medical Association. It's a database, pretty thorough. Uh, some of the data on it is maybe five, six years old, but it's still pretty thorough. It's the best that's out there. It's better than picking up the phone and trying to call and get information from every program. They have different sets of identifying information depending on what their survey returned. So, but it's the best that we got. So definitely use Frida. Yeah, so this is a, it's a private company and, and we have no comments about them. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't know what to tell you about that. 2019 graduate, I have uh, other clinical job experience and did not use my rotation and work experience. Do you think this affects my application? Well, I'm, I'm really going to be looking at 2023 experiences. So that's what I would want to look for in the applicant. Then we can talk about other experiences. So it all depends on, you know, whether it it's like what a medical student does. And so that should be your litmus test. If not, then then you probably unless it was impactful it was very meaningful and if you really truly believe that's what's going to get you an interview then talk about it but that's how you should really think about it just like what we just did right now with our registrant uh dg this is my first time applying trying to find out how your works especially timeline um 
keep coming to these webinars. We, we're going to go through the whole, all 25 of them there. We're going to talk about, uh, just go through our, our, our YouTube channel and, and look at each one of the presentations that we have. And you can certainly look at the timeline. The biggest timeline, the most important thing is five, four, three, two, one. Your biggest thing that's going to stop you right now is if you delay any further starting your clinicals like in June. If you keep delaying that, you can forget about the opportunity to 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 have enough letters to to even be a competitive candidate. So the biggest thing I can tell you with regards to timeline, get into clinical experiences immediately. And if you're having a tough time doing it, you can't find it. Y'all, we are here. I mean, this is what AC Medical does. And we have a fantastic website that you guys can go in and search and find your clinical experiences. 351 clinical sites, really great filtering mechanisms on the site. Take advantage of all of these, right? You can filter by specialty. You can filter by state. You can filter by, you know, whether it's on promotion, whether letter of recommendation came on letterheads, whether our past rotators have reported that they got interviews and match uh, in, in, in hospitals and residencies that the attending physician is, is associated with whether it offers instant booking meaning let's say that you you need to start in a week and a half and you can't wait for an approval to come in that's what you click instant booking means we already have pre-approvals we already contacted them we're in constant communication with that clinical site and you can get approved within seconds um and so take advantage of these so the there's no reason why this process of you securing letters of recommendation and gaining clinical experiences should take any longer than you know a few days you know our, our staff is really really proficient they're very efficient we have some incredible tools take advantage of these and one of the most important things look at these for example highest rated you can you can just look for those if you don't trust what the, your clinical experience is going to be open one of these up there we go let me just open this one up just to show you this one is one of our newest sites and review and read this these are these are these are original these are exactly what the members have said the only thing that we take out is the name and identifying information that's it this is exactly what they they mentioned and and we posted so take a look at the reviews if it all makes sense you like it uh the price is right the start date is 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 good then you know what else is there so timeline wise that's the biggest hurdle that that most people have issues with which we've solved and we're very very efficient and so take advantage of this and 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 play around with this idea really and contact us you don't upload your cv that's automatically created uh with your ers application mspe depends it's you either do it through ecfmg or your school uploads it and we're talking and your letters of recommendation is through letter of recommendation portal and let me see and and if you have more questions please go to sign up for uh you know a, a free consult i'm more than happy to speak with you there why are some special spaces are still unfilled? I, I probably need more information on this. I, I don't know how to answer that. If you want to raise your hand, I'll be more than happy to um, speak with you if this is still a question of yours. Uh, which specialty mostly matches with the older? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't even want to enable that type of thinking. Uh, I, I'm not even going to answer this. I, you're, if you have to worry about your age, if you have to worry about your age and whether you go, you, you need a specialty that's going to be okay with your age, um, maybe maybe residency is not right for you at this point. Because if you're worried about competing with a young person that that has just graduated from med school, you got to wonder why. Is it stamina? Is it because you have other obligations? Is it because you feel you're going to be um, discriminated against? Is it because you just never been in the United States? Is it because you just had bad mentors and they don't know how to help you overcome uh, whatever is eating away at your confidence? You'll never see me talk like this about my age ever because I don't feel like that. And I won't tell you how old I am because that's not the way I feel. Uh, and you should do the same thing. And the, but the reason is not because I, I wake up like this. No, because I worked at it and I know what people, how they will judge me. So I work hard. These 25 presentations, for example, is not because I love to create these and 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 put all of these hours and just and eat away at every minute of my life. No, because that's what it takes to be able to mentor you all. Right. I have to be on top of my game to be able to answer your questions. And that's how you got to prepare for this PGY1 program that you're applying to. There is no shortcut to be good at what you do. It's hard work and, and not being afraid of competition. That's the bottom line. So. If you want to do well as a PGY1, stop thinking that way. Stop. Actually ask, who is my, I would have loved to see that. I'm a little bit older. 
I want to know who my competition is and what do I got to do to make sure that I do, I, that I come out stronger than them, that I impress them more. There is, there is a person here that there's one of our members older, just purely because I've seen their um, video, but I would have never even guessed how old this individual is when I was speaking with them. Sharp, strong. He's probably in his sixties, strong, um, driven, done a bunch of clinicals and and it's just pleasure to speak with him and i can trust everything that he says and i go out of my way to help this individual and and he's going to get into residency not because he shortcutted things it's because he went right up in front of what he thought that could break him and he stood up in front of it and he learned how to defeat it and that's what you all have to do please those of you that graduated a long time ago and you've just been away from what competition is about that's what you got to focus on you used to be competitive. Don't forget that. All of you that are here used to compete and many of you still compete. Just life happened and you forgot about yourself. You have to, 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 to take care of your family. You have to make sure your child is fed. I get that, but that doesn't mean that you're done. Okay. So please let's not do this again, right? Because this is not going to help you survive. You're setting yourself up for somebody being a bully in residency to you and you just break it apart okay and so you got to be ready for those times anyways i'm going to stop <laughs> uh where the application is the best to address red flags very technical question need to know what the red flags are need to know how you can defend it need to know how you sound need to know if it's even a red flag and and need to know the reason so uh much deeper answer to that what part of the application should i talk about work experiences and work as a physician in another country well, it's no longer like that, right? You shouldn't think like that. You should really fit first think. I get 10, I get 10 experiences to talk about maximum. Which 10 experiences of my life do I want to talk about? And what's important to me, is it really going to get me an interview? That's how you got to think about it. It's, again, it's not about chronological order of events. I have to keep rethinking. I like I'm ever since this happened for the past two months, as we've been doing these webinar series, I've just had to retrain my brain in how i'm advising our members the only reason why i want you to know the chronological order of events is because i know in the interview you're going to be asked about how you what you've been doing since graduation i get that but here here i'm not worried about that as much anymore so the question that you would have to ask is does me being a physician in another country going to get me an interview here i don't know my gut tells me no that's not the reason why i would give you an interview but let's say that you were a physician in an Air Force base in another country and you had English speaking patients, Americans, which is our healthcare system, traveled abroad on that Air Force base. Yeah, that's a pretty cool experience to talk about. I think that's good because it shows that you have some sort of experience with US healthcare, but it was in your country. So you could look at it from two angles. That's a pretty cool experience to talk about. But just you being a physician abroad no i'm gonna have a and if that if you, that's one of your 10 if it's just purely about you being a physician i'm gonna probably question whether you're still teachable but again i'm not judging you i'm just saying that that's how they could be interpreted what are the negative impacts of the proposed changes in the new era's application and any lots of negative if you can if you're not careful i hope i've been able to carry that message across and i think throughout this presentation i've, I've just kept bringing in you know the the pluses and the minuses and and how um how careful you have to be in in balancing what you talk about even as 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 early as this this last question that i answered about being a physician in another country uh what can be done to overcome those disadvantages and there's i uh, we gotta we, you know what honestly uh, clinical experience recent ones four or five months of it in the u.s almost <laughs> almost overcomes 80 percent of disadvantages and uh and you can test me on it. Just meet with me and, and tell me about your red flags that you think you have. And let's talk about how three months of, you know, really high, intense, great clinical experience doesn't, doesn't overcome it. Let's, let's talk about that. I'm telling you, it's, it's like, it's, it's like magic. It's crazy. Uh, that's why I'm such an advocate of it. And, and it's not something that we created. It's, this is just the way it is. That's how medical education, even in your own country, even here in the United States, if you're a medical student, what is the 50 percent of your even 60 70 percent of your medical education what is it clinicals practical patient contact why does it have to change now that you come to the united states it doesn't it's more of the exact same thing so stop fighting it go with it and do it but just do it in this country and do it the right way 
uh, because they really care about the legal aspect of things. And and there's a lot of attorneys here. What can be done? I could be talking about it. And what should I focus on when uh, filling out the application to improve my chances of matching? I think we, 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 we address it in multiple places. What are program directors looking for in my ERAS application that will make it stand out? Well, now, your true self. Your true self. I'm going to know everything about you now. In this When I open up this application, I'm going to know about whether how you write. I'm going to know what matters to you. And what matters to you is it matter to me. And how in line are we? It's almost like... Ah... <sighs> It's like dating, you know? It's like uh, you need to try to see uh, whether you mesh now and um, and you kind of, you know, feeling each other out in the beginning mentally and you know, see if there's any attraction and, uh, you know, it's, um, well, what are these dating sites? They, 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 they you know, they, they talk about all these things that they're interested in and if somebody looks at it and says, oh, you know, I don't really think like this. I don't talk like this. Maybe I click, skip, whatever. And that's the way this is too now is, you know, you're just, you're, putting everything out there and you're helping them skip or not skip. And I can't think of any other closer um, uh, you know, comparison than, than that. The more I think about it, the more it's like that. And that's how really human behavior is. Um, so what is the application process specifically for non-US international? Um, uh, well, this application process is intense, right? I mean, just follow the, the 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 series of our webinars and the topics we have and and just look at the topics i mean did you, did you i'm not sure look at this i mean i'm gonna remember i think it's important that you just look at the topics like i mean we put some weeks into coming up with these topics look at this let me let me just look, look at the things that matters in the residency application it's not just research it's not just the application it's your mspe clinical experience letters of recommendation how to prepare go watch webinar number five please knowing how interviews are granted, knowing how rejections, uh, how people get rejected, knowing how you can get rejected, you can increase the odds of getting interviews. Once you have that foundation, once you have that, then we talked about ERAS, right? And we talked about ERAS. Next, what else? You got to worry about your interview auditions because you don't want to really, you don't want to, you don't want to do it in the interview season. If you've got a lot of uh, uh, red flags, that's going to be tough. You want to do it before the interview season so they don't reject you and, and you have four weeks to spend with them knowing that they already rejected you. How to explain red flags. I think there's a lot of questions around that. And then once you do all of those, how to use those to secure more interviews. So there's three aspects to secure an interview. How interviews are granted, how rejections are given, and how do you increase the odds of interviews? I mean, there's literally three different components to it. Um, uh, how do you... Um, how do you select the programs and specialty? This year, we're gonna focus more on that because of the way that the application is and, and signaling. Then we talk about IMG friendlies and, and whether there is such a thing or not. And you're gonna be pretty surprised at, at our angle on, on IMG friendliness. Who supplies it, a, a, a submits the application on time versus late? You see how many things are have to go into the entire application process. You gotta think about these things. Uh, and then knowing interview questions, even before the interview season starts, right? You have to know because that's how you got to think about what your 10 experiences are going to be. And then we're going to go ahead and do some mock interviews. And so, you know, uh, practicing them post interview. And then once you interview, what do you do after the interview, right? All, this, this whole thing is, is the, all the process you have to think about. And then, um, what if you don't have enough interviews? What do you do there? And, uh, what about supplemental offer and acceptance program? How do you plan for all of that now? And, are there interviews that are given late in the season? And 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 once you do all of this, now how do you get ranked? I mean, you do it's not that's now you got to make sure that you continue to maintain their interest. And what if you interviewed in late September and now it's March and you're worried that they forgot about you and they haven't communicated with you? What do you do then? And how do you plan to make sure that doesn't happen? And then we're gonna and then how you put your rank order list together can make or break your entire chances. And so that we're gonna have a live workshop on that and then. Yeah, so you do all the 24 things and you're still unlucky and, you know, and you have to go through post-match and off cycles. And so, so this entire interview, the, the application process, it's got 25 pieces to it. Uh, and it's not just a timeline. And so, um, I'm sorry, it's not easier, but at least a good thing is that we're here for you and we're on top of it. And we're going to make sure that you're on top of it too. We talked about that. Okay. Can we describe an ideal application for secret internal medicine? Nope. Can't. Uh, well, actually, you know, I can't. It's somebody that I don't stop looking at their application within the first 60 seconds. Probably 
somebody that I can keep looking. Ideal is not an instant feeling. Ideal is something that you build. And it's a feeling that continues to um, strengthen as we're going through the application. And if that feeling doesn't develop and doesn't keep growing, then that person is probably not ideal. And so that's how you got to look at your application as you're putting it together. And it's pretty tough to do that if you've never been in the shoes of somebody who selects somebody like you, which is why having a mentor is so important that, a, that has done this. That's what AC Medical is about. That's why we say we make doctors is because we've been through the entire process ourselves. Uh, and this is my job, by the way. I am not practicing medicine right now. It's not that I can't. I was a chief resident. I graduated. I have a Georgia license. I, I have all of that. I'm doing this because this is a full-time job. And there's absolutely no time to do anything else. <laughs> That's why I'm doing it. And I can't practice medicine is because for me to be able to do this, I can't do the other. So I have to choose between it. It was a very, very tough decision. So an ideal candidate is somebody that just the feeling just develops that, hey, this is the right person that we've got to have a part of our team. What if you have more than 10 experiences? Pick. Well, you want to write them all out, right? You want to all write them out loud and then talk with me, not just anyone talk with me, talk with people that understand this entire process and, and drill it down. Maybe you can take some of those experiences and use it for your personal statement. Maybe you can use some of those, you know, you got to come up with, we got to come up with 10 and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe half of your 10 are about the same exact thing and you're just not seeing it. So that's why it's important that we, you, you, you vet it and you slice it and dice it and you, you let, let somebody with, with um, trained eye look at it too. How to describe uh, our experiences on CV. That's uh, that's that's really generic. I, I don't know how to answer that. It, it's just very specific. We have a hand raise. Let's go ahead and raise. Uh, let's go ahead. I believe uh, N I uh, N I. If you can um, unmute yourself. Hmm. Hi, Dr. Mazani. It's me, Hello. Dr. Islam. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. Um, I was curious. Like you know how previously they would filter out application based on the USMLE scores and other things such as the year of graduations but with this new holistic approach how will like you know the applicants be filtered out am i making sense Do you yeah, yeah yeah for sure okay. you know what there's they mm -hmm. can still do that unfortunately and you know uh, as as um enforcers in graduate medical education which there's no such a thing it's just people that have uh collectively they have uh, recommending powers what they've done is they we already accepted that we can't change personalities. We can't, and if we force, if we force them to stop looking at a year of graduation and we force them to stop looking at at steps, they'll probably either quit their positions or they're just they're still gonna try to find a workaround. You're gonna have people like that. You should go along with what the trend is right now, which is mm -hmm. holistic application review. And I wouldn't let your graduation or score stop you because thankfully mm -hmm. there is there is being frowned upon now some of the gmes what they're doing is they're blinding the reviewers to those key data uh and and it's been pretty impressive like when they get the application they don't share the usmle transcript they, from from director of uh, designate dio they don't uh allow the transcript to be a part of the application they will let them know how many attempts that they've had but they will pull that uh, they won't let them know your graduation. So some programs are doing that, depending on how seriously they're taking this holistic, but this is all brand new. You should go with the flow and and do uh, put your ERS application together based on what is going to most likely get you interviews based on their mission, general mission, goals, and uh, settings that that program is looking for. Those are the three things you should focus on because those are the things you can change. You can't change anything else. Those right. are the things you can change. So I'm not just saying you can't change it, so don't worry about it. No, you can't change it. Do worry about what's going to get you an interview, which are focusing on the program's mission, goals, and settings. And you can do those. Again, I told you all with the clinicals. Clinical experiences is going to allow you to say, these are my geographical preferences. This is my setting that I prefer because I've done these clinical experiences here. Mission and goals, I can help you with your mission and goals because when I was in this clinical rotation, this is what we did. We did this community outreach. I know about ACG and core competencies. I mean, I can go on and on. So if mm -hmm. you do those things, you can less and less worry about your graduation and sco scores because you can just overwhelm this application with things that these programs are looking for. And that's how you get these interviews. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And the, the second strategy, when you mm -hmm. do put this much time into your application and you have these great clinical experiences, apply, up, send your application out to as many programs you can afford. Don't mm -hmm. buy a list. 
that says, oh, you qualify for these programs, those lists are gone. They are just worthless. You need to put the best application you can together based on mission setting and, and goals and send it out to just this wide cast of net. It's like you're fishing and you got a net. Throw it out there. The bigger your net, the more fish you're going to catch, right? Right. Now, if your net has a bunch of holes, fish are going to skip right through it. Mm -hmm. If you get a great net and you got a huge one, bravo. Awesome That's analogy. <laughs> application. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Great question. We have another hand that's raised. And you all, thanks so much for staying here. I know you've been here. You spent your whole evening and afternoon with me. I'm, I'm really honored. Thank you. I am. Please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you so much for uh, giving me up. My pleasure. My pleasure. So I was like, you told us a uh, clinical rotation website uh, and I checked over there. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, you know, every week it involves money. Oh, definitely. So my idea, I, my question is, uh, if somebody, you know, is per week, like let's say it's that this much amount per week. So if somebody does two weeks or three weeks, is it okay if we do just two weeks at a place or, or we have to do one month minimum? You need four to five months. Oh, okay. In okay. one place or one well, special. Okay. So let me let me address your first thing that you mentioned. I'm just looking at the price over here. Mm. $328 to $359. Per week. Per week. Yeah. Let's say you spend 30 hours at this clinic with this doctor. How much does that work out an hour? That's less than minimum wage. Okay. What are the benefits of doing a month with this with this clinical site? That has gotten a hundred percent review. Let me just open this up just a bit. That's just one review, but still, the benefits are letter of recommendation, which is required, hopefully, if you perform well. Clinical experience, almost every program wants at least four to six months of experience in the US recently. You have to have that. It's not just one month, two or three weeks. And if you truly cannot do more than two to three weeks, it's not because of financial reasons. If it's because of financial reasons, then there's a lot more problems that that that's up ahead and 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 I want you to have an honest discussion with yourself and I'm not afraid to talk about it because I've been in your shoes and I'm fully fully sensitive towards how much this whole thing costs this is not your problem that's not the problem the problem is all the costs involved if let's say that there was I'm not saying yours is but let's say that there was an extra attempt at USMLEs if it's been 10 years since you've really had any good patient contact if there is no other letters of recommendation that are out there that you could get. And let's say you have a letter from five years ago and you're hoping that you get another one, and then you're gonna go into the application season. You already know that, look, there's a lot of things missing in my application, but let me just go through it anyways, because you know, so what? If I'm not successful, you know, I still have a job and maybe my, my spouse has a job and we're still gonna make ends meet. Let me just go through it. And that's not the way we should, any of us should be thinking about this. To apply to programs, the more red flags that we have, the more programs you have to apply to with a, with a complete application, you shouldn't even apply or even waste your energy on, on applying to these programs if you know there's some big chunks missing that is truly required because that's gonna cost you three to $5,000 just to apply and a year of your life. So I don't think this is the problem. I think we just have to have a sit down and really talk about how much all this process is gonna take and is this really the right time for you to do this? Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it's not going to be a ground shaking impact with just doing two to three. So I'd rather you not do it at all. Now I'm you getting your point. Yeah. You know, I'm getting it. Yeah. Uh, uh, a quick question before I forget. So uh, you said five months of USC. So can I do one month uh, uh, like at diff like five months at different places? Like let's say five yeah, places. And then you should, you should. I'm I'm a I'm I'm against anybody staying at a at a clinical site unless there's a really good reason, with the exception of emergency medicine. Maybe surgery if it's if there's a lot of surgeons in that clinical. No, site. no, fa it's for me, family medicine because okay. so you that know, I can get. Go, uh, you gotta go to different clinical sites because the five. So that I can of, get more LORs from different yes. sites. Okay. The, the 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 reason why we say five is it's is because you know you need if you're gonna go through the match, 
take advantage of of all the resources that you have. You're in a race, right? So you got to be able to just put 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 on the gas and and race, right? That's the competition part. So you need four letters of recommendation. Reality of it is one of those positions is going to disappoint. Two of them are going to disappoint. And so you've already made this huge investment. September comes around and you end up with one letter of recommendation. Then then we're going to have to have a conversation about what are we going to do? I mean, do I even tell you to apply? And I don't want to be in that. That's why that's where five comes in. So most of the people do like four months, but you definitely got to go to like four different places because you need four letters of recommendation. Sometimes you'll get lucky. There's a couple of physicians that work in a clinic. Maybe you spent enough time with them. Maybe you'll get a couple of letters there. But you asked me about two weeks. Physicians in the U.S., majority of them are uncomfortable recommending anyone with just two weeks of, of experience. I, I would rather you not be in a situation like that. That's why we, we because we're not here just to, you know, get $600 from you and, and, and uh, you know, put, give you clinical experience. It's our job is to make sure we're actually doing this for the right reasons. And and how angry are you going to be if you do two weeks and you spend a thousand bucks and and then you find out the physician at the end tells you, eh, I don't think you were here long enough. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But I know that the chances of that are significantly less at four weeks. We just know that because that's how the system works. So that's why we strongly recommend four weeks. It probably yields one letter of recommendation. So that's the reason why where five months comes from. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Great questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, no hands are raised. Let me see how to describe your experience. Okay, what has changed since uh, the last? Okay, we talked about that, uh, the changes. And how important are your work experiences if you are older? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just going to concern. Oh, but well, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it in a, in a different way. Let's say that in an application until 2023 match, in an application, I saw a lot of work experiences that were not clinical rotations. Let's say it was work as a physician, house officer, you know, clinic owner, uh, non-medically related. That tells me this person is hand their hands in a lot of different areas, which means I'm going to deal with a personality that's, you know, already formed and it may not be the, 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 aligned with our mission and goals. So the less really, really older experiences you talk about, the better it is for you because you gotta, you have the application has to look fresh. So talk about fresh stuff. So that's what I got to say about that. Not because of, yeah, and, and, and that tells, it tells me that this person is, I don't know, not that it matters to me, but maybe I'll bring him in and, and they're just going to have a tough time even adapting to my technologies, right? If you're going to bring anybody on board, bring in an employee on board, you better know exactly what you're up against. And we don't want to do you wrong. So one of the questions I love to ask is how fast do you type? Ask yourself that for those of you that think you're older graduates. Ask yourself, how fast do I type? Does anybody know how many words per minute you type? Like, you know, have you tested it? I know what it is. You know, and then you may not know what it is, but that is a, a, a good litmus test for just seeing, oh, well, you know, how, you know, do they know how to, because if you don't know how to type, most likely you're not going to know what a CRM is and, and you're not going to have a tough time typing as you're speaking with a patient. And most likely I'm going to have a tough time with, you know, trouble with, with, with your records being late because of why the person has to look and they have to go like this as they type, right? Look how simple it is for me to just say no to someone, not because they're not qualified, not because they're older is because they can't get the job done because they allowed their age to be the crutches for them to not get with the times. The times right now is virtual, everything, technology, everything, GP chat, GP, what is that called? The, 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 the whole AI, that's what we're dealing with right? Let's get on and, and get on, uh, get on the bandwagon rather than just, you know, making ourselves look older. So that's all of the, of the reasons. So if your application is fresh, I'm not even going to look at your age because I'm just going to, everything's going to make sense to me because that's the world that we live in right now. All right. And I, I think this is the last slide. And would it make a difference to not specify preferred geographical area? Look, it's like, um, you know, it, this is a fantastic way of getting an interview, like to make a program say, look, I'm a really good match to you because I'm in your region. We don't have to look far. Every university, what, what do universities like to do? In the US at least, if you're in the US, California universities love to, to bring in California residents. Georgia residency programs need to keep their graduates so they've practiced there. There is a reason why geographical preference is important is because where you've set your roots are most likely where you're gonna stay. Now, if you have no roots anywhere, that could also be detrimental to you because if you're not able to establish roots and 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 build upon it, then 
maybe you're just going to get up and leave after graduation. And I'm one of, one of those. I was in Georgia and I was at, at, at Morehouse and I can't tell you how disappointed they were. And I kind of was with myself too. When they found that I'm leaving Atlanta and I'm coming to California, I felt like such a jerk because I know that they depended on me and I had every intention of staying there, but I had to at the end of the day, I had to choose my family over the region. I, I had chose family, but if my family was in Atlanta and if one of their criteria was geographical preferences based on social support and based on who lives there, they would probably, well, they would probably not have selected me, right? Because that's what they care about. I mean, it was good for me that they didn't, but that's how important geographical preferences and Morehouse, whoever's there, I'm sorry that I haven't, but you know, I, I love you all. And I'm, I'm supporting Morehouse. I do a lot of things to make up for that. Um, but that's how important geographical preference is. So now that it's here, you can do something about it. And, you know, if, we're all going to go through a situation that I did. And, and it's, you know, but, but it's important that at least right now you think about commitment and you say, okay, look, if, if I get there, I'm willing to stay there because I tested it and I know about it. Same thing with clinical experiences. I've done it in the US and that's the reason why I'm gonna make a great family physician. I've done internal medicine. That's why I'm gonna be a great internist. And that's the reason why I should get an interview. So great question. I think that this is okay now that you have, as far as your, where you're ready for your research experience, if it was employment and not volunteer, it doesn't have to be volunteer. Research could be, you know, you could have been a paid research associate. It could be a research fellow, it, it just so anyways. Paid or unpaid does not seem to be the focus of these entries. Uh, it's more about how you categorize and characterize and what's the context and, and what you got out of it and what kind of skills you're going to bring to the program. That's what they care about. So again, that's why I love the changes that are made because it just takes everything that we thought mattered and says, no, mm -mm, no, all of that was just fluff. You made it all up because you made this, uh, all these bad advices made you think this way. This is how people think. And this is the way that we should be treating this. I love the direction that this is going. And then what specific uh, advice would you offer to preliminary residents? Ooh, mm hmm So I'm assuming you're a preliminary resident right now. I'm assuming, I'm gonna make some assumed assumptions here. I'm not gonna ask you to go to mine. It's up to you if you wanna go ahead and uh, you know raise your hand, but you probably don't wanna do that. Okay, so if you were a prelim resident right now in May, well, I'm assuming that you're a prelim resident, you're about to finish. Hopefully everything is going okay. You're going to hopefully finish on time. I'm wondering why did you apply to preliminary to begin with? You're going to have that to explain in your application. That's probably going to be one of the, the experiences and maybe that's one of the most impactful uh, or one of the most meaningful experiences. And, and, um, you know, you're, you probably got some explaining to do to some programs. I'm not, I'm not sure if I would make that 100% positive or it was negative. But I would probably want to say that that that's got to be uh, that's going to have to be a focal point of your application because if I see a preliminary resident applying for categorical, I'm questioning whether you understood the healthcare system here to begin with. Why why are you in a preliminary? Why did you even apply? I'm going to question whether you you're a resident in trouble. I'm going to question whether you're on probation or you were or not because if there if there's residency and, and there were some mistakes that you made there's probably mistakes that you made in maybe none of this is true but my mind is just going to go in so many different directions so the biggest concern i would have with your application this cycle would be the impression you're giving to categorical programs applying for pgy1 again i have some ideas for you if if you are here or if you're listening please let's do a console again it's free i i, I want to give you some ideas it's, it's just it's a little bit complicated but but uh there's a way that you could make the most of this so um i think is that it oh yeah and the five four three two one okay everyone this is uh I mean, we spent a lot of time i i, I prepped you guys I, I was saying this is a really significant presentation that we're going to be doing hopefully you feel good about it you got a lot out of it hopefully i made it worth your time uh the the, the, the 45 minutes that i that, that we had to delay in the beginning I uh, really appreciate you all being here. If there is any questions you have, we're always here for you. Sign up for a trials for free and uh, and just pick our brains. You know, this is this is what we do and we love it. Uh, so looking forward to meeting you all in consults or even next week. Thank you so much for your time again and proud of you all for the courage that you have for going through this and 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 you're gonna get there. And we're gonna be right there by your side. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful evening and have a wonderful weekend. Bye bye.